This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual town council meeting. I will call on each councilor by name. Uh, please answer so that we know you can hear us and we can hear you. And then we please make sure you mute your mic. Um, this is also how we will conduct the meeting. Uh, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the October 19th, 2020 meeting of the Amherst Town Council to order at 632. This meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. There is no chat room. If you have technical difficulties, we will make note of that. And if we have to stop the meeting, Meantime, I want to draw particular attention before I take roll to the fact that tonight for the first time, we have the ability to do closed captioning if you're watching this on Zoom. And that is on the bottom of your bar. And when you go there, if you'll put the, we now have this up, uh, that you join on Zoom as a a desktop client or mobile. And when we begin, the notification will be a little CC box down at the bottom, such as the one you see on the screen. And if you click on that, you can choose which kind of closed captioning you would like to see. This will also be shown on the screen of Amherst Media as we go forward. So with that, I'm going to call the role of the town council. Uh, Thank you. Um, Shalini Balmain. Shalini, present? Yes. Uh, Alyssa Brewer? Present. Patty Angelis? Present. Darcy DeMont? Present. Lynn Griesmer, present. Mandy Jo Haneke? Present. Dorothy Pam? Dorothy, could you please unmute and I, I was unmuted and, I, and then I muted myself. Thank you very much. Uh, Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane will not be with us this evening. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. Okay. Um, there are some meetings that are shown on the agenda, but I wanna make a correction to two of them. First of all, in terms of council committee meetings, there will be no finance committee meeting tomorrow. Um, the second is the town services and outreach committee, instead of, instead of meeting on October 22nd, will meet on October 29th and it will meet at 4.30 instead of 6.30. Okay, in addition to that, there are two other announcements that we're showing. One is regarding the COVID hotline and the other is regarding the emergency rental assistance program. Okay. Thank you. We're going to take that down and we just, uh, we are going to officially begin the public hearing on the master plan. Uh, this hearing is in advance of asking the council to adopt the master plan. The adoption of the master plan is in accordance with section 9.8B of the charter. The master plan or any amendments thereto shall be approved by the planning board and then be submitted to the town manager to the town council, by the town manager, to the town council, which shall hold at least one public hearing thereon. The town council shall adopt the master plan with or without amendments. 
So we have already held a public forum on the master plan. That was earlier on Tuesday, September 29th. Today, we are doing the actual hearing and we will have it on our agenda for the first time. And then it will return our, on our agenda a second time, which will be on, in November, on November 9th. And at that point, if we are ready, we will vote. Um, we are going to have a brief presentation of the memo that uh, Mr. Bachelman has prepared for us, and he will be assisted in this by Christine Brestrup. Paul? Thank you. So um, under the charter, that's the town manager's responsibility to transmit uh, a request for the master plan to be reviewed by the town council. And of course, this has been ushered through the entire process by our planning director, Chris Brestrup. We also have the uh, chair of the planning board, Jack Jemsek here. So I'm gonna turn it right over to Chris, who's already done a, a primer on it for the council and for the public, but she can give a brief synopsis for those who are new uh, and have not listened to it before. So Chris. Well, I wasn't really prepared to give a presentation tonight. Um, I, I was under the impression that we had already had the presentation and I wasn't asked by Lynn to give a presentation. That, that's true. The presentation is in our packet. And if people have questions about the presentation, they can ask those during the hearing. Um, the presentation, as I mentioned before, was done on Tuesday, September 29th. Is there anything else you'd like to mention, in fact, about the master plan at this time, Christine? Would you like me to summarize Mr. Bockelman's memo to you? That would be great. Thank you. All right. So um, Mr. Bockelman has prepared a memo about um, the master plan and tried to capture uh, all of the, um, the history of it and the ins and outs of it. Um, the planning uh, board was asked by town council to update the master plan um, sometime during the winter of 2019 and 20. Um, and during the time that the planning board spent um, assessing the master plan, they found that the master plan was really pretty good the way it is. Um, the strategies and goals and um, objectives all seem, most of them seem to still make sense. Um, and so um, rather than trying to update the master plan at this time, the planning board decided to ask town council to consider adopting the master plan. Um, we had been asked to update the master plan using um, the terms necessary and obvious, but um, it turned out that some of those necessary and obvious things would have required uh, a lot more work than we originally expected, um, particularly with regard to demographics and land use. And so um, the planning board and the planning department decided it was better to wait until after the 2020 census to update any demographic information and um, we really need to work with uh, our IT department um, as well as our planners to update any land use changes that have been made. And that's, that's a pretty big effort. It's not just a question of changing the word select board to town council or town manager. It's really, there's a lot more to it. So um, the other day we had a presentation about the master plan and we talked about what a master plan is. Um, and a master plan is, one definition of it is a, um, a dynamic long-term planning document that provides a conceptual layout to guide future growth and development. A master plan is a community's long-term blueprint for its, its future. It's a dynamic document and marks the beginning and not the end of the process. And it's not the same as zoning. Um, it contains many, it contains I think 10 uh, different chapters um, and I can go through those. Uh, Land use is one of them, demographics and housing, economic development, <clears throat> natural and cultural resources, open space and recreation, services and facilities, transportation and circulation, and the last one is implementation. And of course, the master plan starts off with goals and policies. Um, it also contains key directions for the town, such as maintaining Amherst's existing community character and providing housing that meets the needs of all residents and diversifying and expanding the economic base and pro promoting an ethic of sustainable environmental energy practices in all town activities. 
Um, <clears throat> the master plan um, is on the town website um, and it, it really began about uh, mm, more than 12, 22 years ago, I guess it was now, in 1998, when the Comprehensive Planning Committee was formed. And the Comprehensive Planning Committee worked for, worked diligently from that time until about 2006, um, when they turned uh, the reins over to um, planning Amherst together. But the Comprehensive Planning Committee uh, was very active during those 12 years that it was really involved. And it, um, published an Amherst Visions report, which is online. It conducted planning exercises and obtained funding for a build-out analysis. It gathered and analyzed data and published a build-out analysis and future growth scenarios. It worked with a UMass planning studio on um, village center uh, design and planning. And eventually it started the process that we know as Planning Amherst Together in about 2004, 2005. Um, the current master plan is the first master plan in nearly 40 years. It was based on a lot of public input, um, and that was continuing the work of the CPC, which uh, began around 2005, this effort of, of planning Amherst together. Um, I, I don't know how much more history you want to go into, but we do have uh, uh, plans that are associated to the, with the master plan are listed in the town um, manager's memo, including the sewer extension master plan. Can you do, can you do that? Excuse me, my phone is ringing. Can you oh. The housing production plan, the housing market study, transportation plan, open space and recreation plan, bicycle and pedestrian network plan, community field master plan, and the energy and climate action plan, which is currently being developed. So um, the town um, has implemented a lot of things that are in the master plan. Um, and the, the parts that I'm most familiar with are the land use uh, aspects. The planning board has worked diligently for the last 10 years um, implementing the master plan by making changes to the zoning bylaw. The select board had developed a charge for a master plan implementation committee in accordance with chapter 10 of the master plan but no members were ever appointed to that committee. And so um, the planning board has really been sort of um, ad hoc uh, implementing the master plan and is planning now to make a careful study of exactly how many of the things that are in the master plan have been implemented. I'm gonna be working with Doug Marshall, who's a member of the planning board on that endeavor. Um, so the next steps are that the town manager, the planning board and the town staff recommend that town council adopt the master plan as it is written, and that the town start the process for the new master plan in about four years, around 2025, with the goal of having a new master plan in place by 2030. The Amherst Home Rule Charter requires the adoption of a new master plan by town council every 20 years, and 2030 is the target date for uh, the new master plan um, <clears throat> since it was first adopted in 2010. Uh, in order to prepare a new master plan, the town will need to appropriate funding to hire a consultant to conduct research and do public outreach. The consultant would be required to do demographic research based on the 2020 census and also um, research our, the changes in our land use patterns. Um, the estimate for preparing a new master plan is probably at least $200,000. That was the amount that was appropriated in the mid 2000s to work on our current master plan. And meanwhile, the town should um, work on implementing the master plan that we have. And as I said, Doug Marshall and I are making an effort to assess exactly which strategies have been implemented and which ones haven't. So thank you very much. And um, I think that's, that's it. Thank you. Before I call on Jack Jemsvik, I wanna go back to uh, town manager Bockelman and ask, I understand you did an update which has been posted and could you just explain the update to us? Yes, uh, thank you for pointing that, for noting that. So there are uh, several, uh, there's one new paragraph and a couple additional phrases that are put on page three of the memo and basically recognizes the, the role of the Comprehensive Planning Committee um, and the development of the previous master plan 
And I think that was important because especially since we're looking forward, this document that you're looking at now will have some um, longevity and people will look back to this to say, where was the council in 2020 as we started this process? And it was important to include this part of the history so that people understood the entire history of the, um, of the process. So thanks for pointing that out, Lynn. Okay, thank you. And thanks for making that update. We appreciate it. Um, Jack Jemsik, who is chair of the planning board, would you please speak to us about the planning board's recommendation? Yes. Um, so on July 1st, we had a meeting and uh, we realized, as Chris explained, that an update to the master plan was not going to be a simple task, as simple as, you know, formatting and, and adding the, the um, you know, nearly dozen plans that have been developed over the last, you know, 10 years, it, it ended up being much more complicated. Plus, we have COVID, plus we're trying to do zoning, you know, bylaws, which again, uh, Chris Brestrup is, you know, assisting Rob Moore on that. Anyway, just it, it, it wasn't going to work out that we could uh, give it a refresh as the town council originally uh, asked. So uh, we did support, um, you know, accepting the master plan or recommend uh, to town council to accept the master plan as written, realizing it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it is a very good document. I mean, it's, it, it took a lot to, to get that together and, and approved and, and passed. And it, it seems like it has everything we need uh, to get us through the next, you know, 10 years. So. And uh, I, I really like uh, Paul and Chris's recommendations there for uh, looking at it in, in, you know, in five years and try to hit that 2030. But the uh, planning board, uh, we recommend that, you, that the town council uh, approve it as is. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Um, Mandy Johanneke, uh, would you please report on the conversation with the Community Resources Committee and their recommendation? Yes, so on July 21st, we took the uh, planning board's unanimous recommendation under advisement. We had uh, the chair of the planning board at the time into our meeting along with uh, the Christine Brestrup planning department head. Um, and after discussion, we voted unanimously with, so four zero with one absent, um, Councillor Swart was not at that meeting, to recommend the town council adopt the master plan as is. Thank you. Um, we are now, later on, we will have an opportunity for councillors to speak to this discussion because it is on our agenda later on, but we are now open to public comment either, and we'll start with an opportunity for residents in favor of, adopt, of having the town council adopt the master plan. Please raise your hand. Okay, I see no hands. Um, are there any residents who would like to speak in opposition to adoption of the master plan by the town council? Okay. Uh, then let me just ask if there's any final comments from Paul or Christine or Jack or Mandy Jo. I don't have any. First of all, we want to thank the planning board for having looked at this and look forward to their report of how we've done on the master plan, which we understand will be forthcoming. So with that, I'm going to officially close the hearing and we're going to move on to the regular to the rest of the agenda. Okay. We start the rest of the agenda with general public comment. Residents are welcome to speak up to three minutes um, at the and we will um, not engage in dialogue with you at that time. However, um, we will make note of your comments and obviously they will be recorded. Um, I will try to uh, make sure that we keep record of all of the comments. And if we could, we'll start with um, Rachel Hayes. 
you're going to enter the room and we'd like you to unmute and go ahead and speak to us. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm the Reverend Rachel Hayes, Minister of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst. I speak tonight in support of the proposed wage theft bylaws. In my role at the UU, I encounter labor justice issues in three main ways. As a person of faith who believes in honoring equity and human dignity, as the head of staff at my organization, and as someone people call in distress when they can't pay their bills. Everybody needs money for food and rent and medicine and an employer withholding pay from workers because they can get away with it is morally bankrupt. As income inequality continues to rise in this country, we need to build protections for our workers into our community. The issue of wage theft touches every facet of oppression in our culture. The less power a worker has due to oppressions of race, class, gender, sexuality, national origin, ability or disability, or any other oppression, the more likely they will not receive fair pay for their work. We can change that. Amherst can join other cities and towns in passing wage theft protections. All of the provisions in these bylaw changes are already being used in other towns. And these changes support employers who play fair by not allowing bad actors to compete for the same contracts and markets. Changing our culture into one that honors the dignity of all human beings will take some work but the town can get us a step closer by providing protection against wage theft. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, Reverend Hayes. Margaret Sawyer. Hi, um, thank you all so much for your tireless work on this, um, these bylaws. We know you're not considering them yet tonight, but we're grateful for everything you've been, um, you've been doing. Um, I'd like to ask, I'm gonna make a few comments and then I wanted to see if it's possible for Jonathan Alvarez to follow me and for me to interpret for him. I don't know if it's possible for us both to be on at the same time or I can follow him too. It is absolutely possible and we'll bring Jonathan into the room so that if you could speak, identify yourself first and go ahead and then Jonathan can unmute and you can translate for him. Okay, great. I'll just finish my comments quickly, which are that um, at the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, um, we really see this as a sign of Amherst's commitment to honoring workers, standing with workers in a time when there are so many challenges facing workers. Um, we were thrilled that you all would still consider the wage theft ordinance during COVID. Um, there's so many other things going on and we are grateful to you for taking this on at this time when we know that workers face so many challenges. Um, so we've seen how this law has been critical in other towns too as a preventive measure, positively reinforcing to employers um, that in this town with the bylaws, we won't allow cheating of employees. Um, it helps to force businesses to follow the law and then face repercussions if they don't. We're also so grateful and consider it so important that you're encouraging the greater diversity in the construction contracts. Um, that's been an important part, especially in these times. Um, at the Workers' Center, we do get complaints of wage theft from Amherst. No one is immune to bosses trying to cut their obligations. Um, we firmly believe that this is a creative and hopefully regenerative time in our country. Obviously, we're facing incredible challenges, but this is a time for building and we're, I'm thrilled as an Amherst resident and also on behalf of the Workers Center um, that the town councilors are boldly and affirmatively tackling this issue to, to make our town better for, for all people and especially people earning, um, earning their wages. Thank you. And if you would please ask Jonathan Alvarez to introduce himself and he can begin his statements with your translation. 
Jonathan, que se presenta y um, yo te traduzco después de cada, cada frase, más o menos, ¿ok? Hola, yo no, soy Jonathan Álvarez. Um, este, quiero exponer un poco sobre mi historia trabajando en Amherst. Hello, my name is Jonathan M. Alvarez. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story of working in Amherst. Um, la experiencia que he tenido no ha sido muy buena. Me gustaría um, dárselas a entender um, muy amplio, pero sé que el, el tiempo es corto. My experience was not very good, and I'd love to have the time to tell you the details about it, but I know that time is, is short. Um, son muchas cosas que, están, que, que pasan detrás de, de todo lo que se ve. Um, no solamente lo pasé yo, lo pasan muchas gentes, latinos, americanos y de, de toda índole. Um, there's lots of things that happen. Um, quiere decir en un negocio, ¿verdad? Sí. Um, in a business, behind that which you see in the front, there's lots of things that happen Um, not just to me, but to other Latinos, to Americans, to everyone. Um, este, nosotros um, sufrimos de muchas cosas. Uh, me gustaría especificarlo, pero no puedo. Um, pero hay mucho uh, este, robo de salario. Hay mucha incertidumbre. Um, we've suffered, we suffer many things. Um, I'd like to be able to explain it, but I, I feel that I can't. Um, we've suffered wage theft and also, y discúlpame, Jonathan, no capté la última palabra. Um, hay mucha incertidumbre, como que nos dejan en el abandono. Um, feeling of, of um, uncertainty, of, of, not, of being abandoned, basically, not knowing where to turn. Uh, me gustaría que nuestra voz um, y nuestros derechos um, sean valorados. Um, no me gustaría que nos dejen en el abandono. Y si es posible luchar um, y exponer mi historia, lo haré. I'd like to see that our, our voice and our concerns are heard, that we're not left relatively abandoned. Um, and if there's an opportunity to more fully tell my story, I would like to do that. Um, un punto muy importante que tenemos que recordar todos, que detrás de nosotros tenemos una familia por la que luchamos, tenemos que ponerle comida en la mesa, hay que pagar renta y los servicios públicos. It's one thing that's so important to remember is that behind every, behind all of us, behind every worker, there's a family and we're working to provide for them, to put food on the table, um, And, and to, to be able to pay the rent and take care of the bills. Um, muchas gracias por escucharme. Si necesitan alguna otra um, explicación más amplia, puedo dárselas. Pueden contactarme de cualquier manera. Thank you so much for listening to me. If you need a more full explanation or information, you may contact me directly. I want to thank Jonathan for your comments and Margaret for your translation. And Margaret, I would like you to ask Jonathan, if he would, to provide us a written uh, statement that gives us more fully uh, things that he would like us to know about his story. And perhaps then we have somebody who can translate that as well in our town hall. That's great. Dice que... Um Gracias. Y también si puede pro proveer um, sus palabras por escrito, si lo harás el favor, um, ellos pueden traducirlo y, y quieren saber más de, de lo que está hablando. Um, claro que sí. Con mucho gusto yo este, puedo escribir todo. Thank you so much. I'd be glad to do that. I'll write everything down. Thank you. We very much appreciate both of you being here tonight. Um, Max Page is our next uh, audience person. Please come forward, state your name and where you live. Hi, it's Max Page. I um, live at 84 McClellan Street, same place I uh, grew up in 54 years ago. I teach at UMass Amherst and I am the vice president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. 
which is the 117,000 member of public school and college and university educators. We're also the largest union in New England. And I just wanna say a few words and really kind of sum up um, with some of the things that have been said so far about this um, wage theft ordinance. One of the, the most basic right of every worker is to be paid fairly on time for the work they do. And clearly this, the reason that we have a statewide um, law on wage theft and why we are asking for these this local ordinance on wage theft is that this that wage theft happens all the time. Seven hundred million dollars, it's estimated, is stolen from workers, and so um, this is a chance for for Amherst to to kind of lead um, and join a, no, a number of other towns and cities in making sure that this does not happen um, in in our towns. And you just heard a, a powerful statement from Jonathan Alvarez, who has seen and experienced this kind of debilitating violation, the theft of, of their labor and their wages. So just very quickly to sort of summarize, first Amherst is joining other cities and towns. This is a, this has happened in Northampton, Boston, Lynn, East Hampton, Springfield, Worcester, Cambridge. A lot of other progressive communities um, are, are moving on this and we should be certainly um, joining them. Many of the elements of our bylaw have been implemented elsewhere. The second thing is that the hope is that actually the point of these bylaws is that they're preventative. By when you raise the stakes for violating wage and hour laws, these bylaws help discourage such behavior. So the hope is actually simply by having on the, the books that prevents their having them to be actually um, used. And then the third point is simply that um, these provisions help assure a fair and wage justice playing field. Um, employers that act responsibly, and that's the vast majority of employers in Amherst, um, will not be undercut um, by those um, committing wage theft. And that's the idea, to create a level playing field and so that the people, the employers who are doing the right thing are not somehow punished for their good behavior. And I just want to end by saying there's some, some comment that I've heard around town is that perhaps there might be problematic for Amherst to be out front in this, that somehow this would expose us somehow. I'm not exactly sure why, perhaps the lawsuits or something. But first thing, as I said, there are many other communities that have done this already. Uh, we would not be at the very forefront. We would be you know, following, but also leading the rest of the rest of um, the state. Um, the goal, of course, is for every city and town to have such an ordinance. But those progressive communities have to start, and it behooves towns that are most committed to social, racial, and economic justice to lead the fight. And I think one of the things that so many of us love about this town is its history of having pushed out in front, whether that's the Vietnam vigils of the 1960s or the first LGBTQ plus literature course at a high school, the greatest of women poets, the, having a town with a foreign policy. I mean, we pride ourselves in having kind of pushed the boundaries. Um, and in this case, let's, let's join some of the other progressive communities and lead so that we actually banish wage theft from the entire state. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you for your comments, Professor Page. Yasmin Kerasi, please state your name and where you're from. Hi, thanks. So my name is Jasmine Kerasi, and I'm also an Amherst resident at 81 Harlow Drive. And I'm a faculty member at UMass in the Sociology Department and Labor Center. And I wanted to talk to you today about why I support the proposed wage theft bylaws. <clears throat> and how my research underscores the importance of strong workplace regulations, especially now with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So when COVID hit, my colleague and I launched a research project to understand how COVID was impacting essential workers here in Massachusetts. And so far, we've done four surveys, one in April, May, July, and September, and we've talked to over 7,000 workers who are doing in-person essential work in Massachusetts. And I'm gonna talk about two things that we found. First, we asked workers a series of questions about their work in home lives during coronavirus, like stress levels at work, access to paid sick leave and health insurance, feeling safe at work, food insecurity, and so forth. And over and over again, in each of our surveys, we saw that workers of color and low wage workers were experiencing the greatest hardships across almost all dimensions here in Massachusetts. And so my takeaway from this is that COVID has been very difficult for everyone, 
but low wage workers and workers of color have been disproportionately harmed. Okay, so second big finding is we asked workers whether they were afraid of being disciplined or fired if they brought up safety concerns at work. And what we found was um, very concerning. So on average, about one in three workers reported that yes, that they are worried that they'd be disciplined or fired if they voiced safety concerns. And that's a very large and troubling number of people and really reflects the lack of power that people are feeling during this time of the pandemic. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, these concerns have been much higher for both low wage workers and workers of color. So for example, here in Massachusetts, 43% of workers earning under $15 an hour were afraid to speak up. And in comparison, um, only 23% <laughs> of those making higher wages over $30 an hour were. Um, so to state the obvious, no workers should be afraid to speak up about safe, basic safety concerns, and yet, that is what's happening. And so how do these findings matter for wage theft bylaws here in Amherst? So it reasons that workers would be just as fearful to speak up about wage theft as they are about safety, especially with few other employment opportunities during coronavirus. And at the same time, with the economy hurting during the pandemic, some employers may be more tempted to take shortcuts. And so, what our research shows and what I believe as a resident is that wage theft bylaws send a strong message to both employers and to workers that Amherst abides by labor law and will not turn a blind eye to wage theft. Uh, so thanks for your time. Thank you, Professor Kerasi. Frank Gomez. Please state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Frank Gomez. I live in Worcester but I work for the um, North Atlantic State Regional Council of Carpenters. I would like to talk about, um, about the projects on Cowles Road in Amherst, where a group of 12 workers reached out to me to ask for help because for the last six weeks, the work over there, they were not getting paid. So when they started uh, asking for the money, they just got fired without getting paid. Many of these workers struggle with the fact that they didn't have money to pay for the rent or to buy groceries, but this is not an isolated case. Since they are very familiar with this business model that many contractors are using, um, they hire a third party labor sub or a labor broker to avoid any responsibility with the workers claiming that they do not work for them. I helped them file a complaint with the Attorney General, and I continued to connect with the workers over the long time it took the Attorney General to investigate. Even though we have all the time sheets and proof that they work at this job, it took 10 months for the Attorney General to finish our investigation. In the end, the workers only received a portion of what they were owed. This is a project that received several million dollars of state taxes dollars, received a major Amherst tax break, and still workers were cheated and not fully paid. This is why we need to pass the, this bylaws. Thank you. Mr. Gomez, thank you for joining us tonight. Daniel Pollock. Please state your name and where you live. Hi, uh, Dan Wallach, 37 Cosby Avenue, Amherst. Uh, Amherst resident for 31 years. I'm also a retired carpenter, having worked in local 135, 108, and 336. I feel very strongly about just compensation for a day's work. This ordinance will ensure that only qualified contractors with a verified history will be allowed to bid on town funded projects. As an Amherst taxpayer, I can feel confident that my contributions to the town coffers that will fund upcoming municipal projects, they will be performed by tradesmen and women 
receiving their deserved wages. I hope this ordinance will not be distorted by partisan politics or be distracted by whether it is an issue of affordability, as this ordinance is about enforcing existing wage laws. Also, I would like to say that this is not a union or non-union agenda. Amherst should get on board with other cities and towns of the Commonwealth in ensuring economic justice on town construction projects. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Wallach, for joining us this evening. Are there any other people who would like to make public comment? This is the only public comment period in our meeting tonight. Okay, seeing none, then we are going to move on with our agenda. Uh, we're going to the consent agenda, which we will put up on the screen. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when I finish the list. And that does not require a second. The motion is as follows, and I'll be looking for a second. To move the following items and the printed materials there under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of the resolution supporting the east-west passenger rail. 9A, approval of the town manager appointees to the following boards and committees. Um, Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, Cultural Council, Design Review Board. 9B, appointment of Councilor Pat DeAngelis as liaison to, afford, to the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, item 11A, approval of minutes, October 6, 2020, Town Council meeting minutes. Is there anyone who would like anything removed at this time? Okay, is there a second? Henneke seconds. Thank you. Then I'm going to move to the roll call vote. We're going to start with Alyssa Brewer. <laughs> well, that's convenient because I just wanted to make sure that you fixed the motion to say it's October 5th minutes. But other than that, yes. October 5th. Thank you very much for it. It was October 5th. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Darcy DeMont. Darcy DeMont. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Griesmer's a yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Thank you. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane is not absent. Uh, is absent, I'm sorry. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Sarah Schwartz? Yes. Shalini Balmilne? Yes. It passes 12, four, none against, no abstentions, one absent. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our presentations. And we're going to start with the report on the zoning bylaw article 14. And for this, Paul Bachman is being joined by Christine Brestrup and building commissioner Rob Mora. Christine, it's been a busy week, a couple of weeks actually. Thank you for everything you've been doing. Uh, and um, I just wanna state that we are not voting on any changes, but in your packet is not only an explanation of the process, but also a presentation of the calendar for us to move this by the, the revisions to this bylaw forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Lynn. So Article 14 is the zoning bylaw that the town council passed at the beginning of the pandemic. We were ahead of the, the state actually um, when we adopted, when you adopted it. 
um, and that gave uh, some leeway to the to the building commissioner to make decisions that otherwise would have gone through in a sometimes arduous permitting process with town boards. Um, we have uh, Rob Mora, who is our building commissioner, and Chris Brestrup, who is our planning director here, to talk about a little bit about how it's been used, um, what other um, changes have been made under the governor's order, and what rec what recommendations they have from their experience and how they would like to see the article uh, changed for your consideration tonight. So um, I think, Rob, are you, do you want to walk through this? Yes, uh, good evening. Rob Moore, building commissioner. Uh, I just want to mention, uh, when, whenever I say we or the town or us, I just want you to know that there were quite a few departments involved with this to make this all happen. Uh, it all came together relatively fast back in June, but planning and inspections, uh, fire facilities, public works, uh, the Board of License Commissioners, uh, the town manager's office, town manager, of course, and all of this was done with uh, great support and assistance uh, from the bid and the chamber. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, June, uh, we started uh, June 5th issuing permits for uh, establishments to either increase or create outdoor dining. Uh, we worked with 17 restaurants. Um, most of those, uh, more, uh, almost half of those uh, were on private property and the remainder were out in the public way where uh, the town manager created the space on North Pleasant, South Pleasant and Main Street. Um, of those eight uh, uh, restaurants on private property, uh, some of those have potential for a permanent outdoor dining expansion uh, you know, in those areas. But at this point, these 17 permits were issued on a temporary basis following the governor's uh, order. Uh, at that time, uh, they were due to expire November 1st. And as you know, now have been extended uh, to uh, 60 days beyond the end of the uh, state of emergency. Uh, so those remain in effect uh, without the need for Article 14. Uh, none of those 17 uh, restaurants actually needed Article 14 to be established uh, at that time. They may, however, uh, at the end of the governor's uh, order, when that expires, uh, be able to benefit from Article 14 if it is in effect next year uh, to possibly continue uh, either on a temporary or more permanent basis. Um, all of almost all of those, I think only one uh, did not receive a uh, extension of the premises from the Board of License Commissioners. So all, all almost all of those establishments were permitted to uh, serve alcohol in the areas where the outdoor dining was occurring. Uh, moving to actually uh, using Article 14 to help establishments, we've had three cases so far. Uh, two of them are pretty straightforward, and, it, and, and one of those is a temporary situation. Uh, I believe you have the memo that was written to, to Town Manager Bachelman, uh that, that explains the, the locations. Uh, one was a salon out in North Amherst. Uh, they actually set up uh, three tents, uh, personal uh, services for uh, salon services to occur out in the parking lot. There was an outdoor water connection made for hair washing. Uh, and, it was, and it was done really nicely. On the same site, uh, there was also an outdoor um, uh, restaurant, outdoor dining uh, created on that private property as well. Uh, we've recently used Article 14 to uh, open a new uh, smoothie uh, shop right downtown. Uh, that was a relatively small project, minor alteration in the, in the, in the outdoor space on the private property for seating. Uh, the most involved proposal so far has been uh, one uh, brought to us by Stackers Pub. They, they currently operated under a special permit, uh, had some outdoor seating at the rear of the building on a patio, and their proposal is to expand the, the patio area, uh, increase uh, some lighting and landscaping, and provide a better access uh, through an alleyway to, to and from that outdoor dining. And that's one that uh, just recently got, we got finished up and we'll probably be starting construction soon. Uh, we've had many conversations with prospective restaurant uh, operators. Uh, I'm, I know I was aware of one possible retail establishment that might benefit from Article 14. 
uh, but those were the three that have actually occurred so far. Uh, we've also had applications that didn't fit into any of those categories uh, that we can say were related to COVID uh, situation. Uh, that, that Article 14 didn't help and that the governor's order didn't help. And those are, those are temporary proposals that came to us from the Jones Library, the Amherst Survival Center, the public schools, uh, private school, and the town of Amherst itself. So that kind of leads me into uh, the new or, or ex expanded possibly, uh, but extended at least uh, Article 14, uh, where you know, we, we would like to discuss, uh, I think we're gonna start with the CRC soon, uh, discussing some of these changes, but really trying to anticipate where could this possibly be used that, you know, we didn't think of the first time uh, that might likely come up, whether it's a tent in the parking lot, changes to the parking or overflow parking arrangements, maybe signage. And what comes to mind are the medical establishments, uh, the public schools, the libraries, the nonprofit institutions, and the town. Uh, also put in the proposal, you'll see uh, uh, a temporary allowance for farm stands. Uh, the thought there is maybe in the spring, there'll be more requests for uh, roadside farm stands from the agricultural community. And we just wanted to be prepared for that. Uh, I think one thing we experienced uh, as uh, school uh, began to uh, making their final decisions on how they were gonna open up uh, there was a need for things to happen fast, and uh, most of these that I mentioned that didn't fit into a category uh, of Article 14 of the governor's order uh, ended up having to go through a process with the planning board. And we were able to move that as long as quickly as possible, but it did, uh, it, it certainly uh, would be uh, nicer, I think, if we were able to, uh, to accommodate uh, those temporary uses in a uh, updated bylaw amendment. Thank you. You're muted, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, Paul, do you have any further comment at this point or Christine before we move to questions? Yeah, just if Chris has anything you want to add. I just wanted to note that um, I hope that you saw the updated version of this bylaw that we uh, sent out today, which includes the office park district, along with the professional research park district. And that was an effort to include the medical offices on um, University Drive, as well as on Research Drive and um, the Valley Medical um, Facility. So um, they may need to set up you know, some sort of tent in their parking lot or, or outside to administer tests or vaccines um, and that type of thing. And we wanted to be able to allow them to do that. So that's all. Okay. Are there questions from the council at this time? Mandy Jo. Well, I apologize that this question isn't directly related to bylaw 14, um, the zoning bylaw. Uh, but this is for Paul. Have you, you know, I went back to the town council policy regarding the control and regulation of public ways, and I read the section we added on zoning bylaw article 14, and it looks like we might need to amend that too. Have you had a chance to look at that, and when might we get those requests? Yeah, depending on the reaction from the council on this change to article 14, I would be advancing a memo to that. That's not a, a bylaw change, it's a policy change by the council. So it could be done pretty quickly. But yes, that would, that would need to be done, Excellent. absolutely. Thanks. And when that comes forward, that goes to TSO for review and then back to the council. Uh, Alyssa. So thank you. So yes, following up on that, that was mentioned at our last meeting. And so that needs to be on the TSO agenda, I suppose, because we talked about that at the last meeting, at the last town council meeting, as well as tonight. The other thing, I'm a little confused process-wise about the fact, I first of all want to make sure it's clear that I am really impressed with the report. It's exactly what we asked for, in my opinion. Um, it is what 
you know, when people express some nervousness about doing this this way, and we said, come on, let's try it, see how it goes. Um, you were very specific about what worked because of the governor's part, what worked because of Article 14, and I think that's just incredibly helpful moving forward. So I thank you very much for that. And I don't understand why we've been given, except for a verbal sentence from Chris tonight and one sentence from Rob tonight, any indication of why this needs such an expansion. We were not given that heads up in our minutes. It's reflected that I said, if there were going to be substantive changes, we needed to know about them sooner rather than later. Um, yes, we saw the words printed on the page, which changed this afternoon in terms of adding another zoning district, but there's zero justification for why we would do that aside from the two sentences I just referenced. So. I don't understand why we wouldn't want to lay groundwork right now, especially given that we had already referred this to CRC on October 5th, and they've apparently been, you know, busy with other agenda items, and so haven't even talked about this at all. And I find it really weird that we're going to have a hearing on this on November 4th, and basically the only thing that anybody knows about it is that it wants to be expanded, not why it wants to be expanded. And I presume that will be reported for the purpose of the hearing. And then of course, obviously there will be a planning report report and a CRC report after the hearing, but I'm just confused about why we would waste this opportunity tonight to have gotten a written document that says why you wanna include those additional zones and for what purposes. I appreciate what you said about the schools and the library. I appreciate what was also finally said about medical because I had no idea why you would wanna expand medical except for the tense issue. And then my final question is associated with, you mentioned retail and passing, but did not mention what that meant. I understood the tents for the schools, the library, the vaccines, the testing, but I don't know what you might've meant with retail or with nonprofits in terms of why they would need this. And I understand you're trying to look forward into the spring, just like with the farmer's stands, but I also want some assurance that this has absolutely nothing to do with any sort of marijuana or cannabis facility of any kind. Um, Alyssa, thank you. First of all, the reason this is on the agenda tonight and is not with action is for the very reason you're stated. So it would be very useful, Paul, Christine, and Rob, if you would give us a little more background as to these various classifications and why now we want to put them on this bylaw. Sure. We can do that. Okay. Um, so a couple things here. What you'll notice is that we tried to establish a temporary use definition to be clear that these new expanded uses for the most part are under a temporary situation. And we tried to define that uh, so that was clear. And it really is as simple as this is what maybe possibly could be useful uh, going forward. There isn't really much more to that. I haven't had specific requests from anything other than the library, schools, uh, public and private schools, and the uh, you know nonprofit uh, institution that I was referring to is the Amherst Survival Center that I had to go through a site plan review process to put up a tent. Uh, so you know that really is it. it you know I've had some uh, requests from the town itself for things like temporary facilities in various locations, uh, trying to anticipate maybe there'll be signage. And uh, when we're talking about the medical uses, it was tents and possibly parking is what I had in mind. Maybe there's a need for overflow parking uh, either on the site or an adjacent site uh, that could uh, benefit from this. Uh, these uses are very specifically laid out and, and, and called out according to our use classification chart. So if it's not there, it's not part of Article 14. Marijuana never did show up, still doesn't show up on this article, and has no intention of appearing in any future amendment of Article 14 as far as I'm aware. Um, retail was there from the beginning, so that's not a change. When I mention retail, it's that I am working with uh, a retail establishment that might benefit from Article 14 as already written, and if extended, uh, could benefit from it. And my, I guess the reason for making that comment is that there hasn't been a lot of activity. I don't think we're, we're at the point that we thought we would be where Article 14 is, is doing a lot yet. Uh, it's just starting to have uh, some effect in those few uh, few instances. And there's a lot of talking about new restaurants, but until they decide to actually move ahead, uh, you know, I think this will be a very beneficial amendment 
when we finally do come to the end of this thing where uh, business owners are starting to, to move forward again. Um, I'm happy to let Chris or, or others uh, add on to that, but it really was um, trying to anticipate where we could be helpful and not have to go through a process, longer process. And I think Chris could probably talk about the staff time that's involved to create a site plan review for the Survival Center or for the Jones Library for a tent that they want to have up for up to 12 months. Chris, please go ahead. So I, I yes, I would say that it, it is a lot of work for town staff who, um, for instance, process a site plan review application for the Jones Library to put up a tent on their front lawn. We have to notify abutters. We have to hold a public hearing. We have to write a decision. We have to make sure the planning board has all the information it needs. And if that kind of thing can be um, administratively approved by the building commissioner rather than going through a public hearing process, it's really um, a time saver for the applicant as well as a time saver for um, town staff. I also wanted to make mention of the fact that it's possible that um, the bank center might want to set up a tent in its parking lot. And not that I've heard of any such thing, but for the same reason that medical centers might want to do that. Uh, namely to test, um, to offer testing and to offer vaccines when it becomes available um, so that they don't have to have people come into their building. So um, those are the kinds of things that, that we're looking at. And um, I think it would be very beneficial to have this ability for a limited period of time to um, grant these kinds of permits. So just to clarify, if we had included these or these other classifications in the original bylaw, the survival center would not have had to go before the planning board to put the tent up? Well, the survival center probably would have had to go because they're proposing a shed. Okay. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how they got the tent up in the first place, but the shed um, that they're proposing now um, had to go before the planning board, even though it's a temporary shed. They're intending to, um, to take it away as soon as uh, COVID-19 is no longer um, an issue. Okay. Um, Shalini, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to firstly thank Rob and Christine and the entire staff that has been working so tirelessly. I mean, I can't even imagine how you've taken on this extra work in the midst of COVID. So just on behalf of all of us, again, thank you so much. And this means so much to the businesses locally. I know that, I don't know if most people know here that so many of the businesses are owned by immigrants. Many of them have their life savings put into starting these businesses. So what you're doing is really, really goes a long way. Uh, one of the concerns that were raised when we passed this earlier on was how it's gonna affect other neighboring businesses or residents since we're not going through the planning board. And I was wondering if you uh, encountered any such situation where there was a pushback or people were not happy with what's happening. And, and one other thing I wanted to say was actually appreciate you are preempting some of these things that may not have showed up like in medical um, and uh, survival center or any of these issues. So thank you so much for thinking ahead. Chris? I don't think we've heard any complaints. I haven't heard any complaints and I think that Part of that has to do with a really great outreach effort on the part of Gabrielle Gould of the bid. She's really been working with all of the merchants and particularly in the downtown area and also Claudia Pasmani um, for the other village centers, um, trying to help them to understand what their rights and responsibilities are with regard to these extended premises. And I think that's really gone a long way. Uh, I, would, I would agree with that. I just wanted to add that the one case uh, where we are looking at a more permanent uh, use of Article 14 for the patio extension uh, at Stackers Pub, that did go through the Design Review Board. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that, that that was um, uh, the recommendations from the Design Review Board were incorporated as conditions of that permit. Okay. Are there any other questions? I just want to mention then that this has already, by vote of our meeting last time on October 5th, it's automatically now been referred to the planning board and CRC 
they will hold a joint hearing on November 4th at 830, 8 o'clock p.m. on this. And then after CRC is done, it will also come to GOL. The goal is to have it come back to the town council for its first reading on November 9th and its second reading on November 16th. Okay. And we're going to move on to COVID. Paul, our update, it's you and Jen Brown. Yes, thank you. I guess. And Jennifer is here too? I am. There you are. Okay, good. Uh, and we have slides. Um, so this is our uh, regular update. You can go to the next slide. So again, we'll follow the same format as we have in the past. You can go to the next slide. And we want to talk a little bit about the cases and what's been happening over the next uh, the last few weeks, the last three times actually we presented to you. Um, and this is this is information as of October 18th. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so what has happened over the last three um, periods of time? We On September 21st, I presented, we had uh, eight cases. October 5th, when we were here, we had 75 cases. And then today, as of this afternoon, um, we had 21 cases. And I think Jennifer might want to talk about like why this up and down and what has happened and why we are seeing cases come off now a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So September 21st, as you said, we have eight active cases, 149 total. Um, two weeks later, we started seeing the spike of that um, cluster and the associated cases. Um, so we actually had additional 92 cases, but 75 cases active. It's dropped down to 21 cases active now. And what that is, is that when people come out of isolation, um, it is a process where a nurse will speak with them and determine if they're symptomatic, if they're infectious, and then take them off. The big drop here, in part, was because patients were coming off, but also um, some of those cases were taken off um, sort of in, in sort of a clump. And the reason that was done, I spoke to the UMass Public Health team today about that. They've been working so hard with this cluster um, that they have been taking care of the patients, but the, the data entry has been lagging a little bit. But what's been do happening is, as I said, they really take great care of their patients. They've identified that their platform doesn't work, their process doesn't work. So they've added um, four new nurses. We have a total of six nurses now. And they're looking at a new system. They think that maybe that red cap may not be working with them. So over the winter, they're going to try to figure out how to make this a better system. So today we do have, I'm going to update our number, not 21 cases. We have 23 cases. This afternoon, I was working on two new cases that are not associated with the UMass students. We have a total of 268 cases. And I think, you know, one of the things that we talked about is that you may see more of this up and down motion for our community is if there's another um, cluster, you will see that in this active case number go up. And then and hopefully as those um, cases age, um, we, people will come off. And what we don't want to see is a consistent up where, where it, even as people come off, we get an increase. So it's a very volatile um, situation. It depends on the spread of the disease. And, but it's something that we work very hard on. You know, Jen mentioned the um, additional staff that UMass has added. We have two registered nurses also who are doing contact tracing for the town. And of course, Jen is really good at doing the contact tracing as well. So we can go to the next slide. So the, the point of this is that we are still considered red as of last Wednesday. The state comes out every Wednesday with a category of what um, what ri what risk level you are, and we are at higher risk, which is the red category. It's the second week in a row that we are in the red category. Um, the town of Sunderland is as well. There was a, a significant uptick in the number of communities uh, that have gone into the red red zone, um, and so it's something that is concerning the state. In fact, if you looked at the state's numbers, the entire state would be in the red zone. If you looked at it as a as a entire state. Um, 
Next slide, please. Uh, and this, this shows the, the communities and this sort of elongated map on who's red and who's not. Um, and there are, you know, a number of cases out uh, in our area. Ours are very concentrated and attached. You, you see uh, Amherst there with Sunderland above us um, is connected mainly to the university cases. And we are at 15.7 incidence rate uh, per 100,000, which is almost twice what the state expects. Next. If I can just yeah, jump in there. Yeah. yeah, thanks. So this this um, <clears throat> determination, the status map, is, you know, as we know, it's the um, average daily incident rate per 100,000 over a two-week period. So that calculation for that number that was published last week was data from September 27th to October 10th. The data that's coming out for this Wednesday is was has been collected already, and it's from October 4th to the 17th. So we may be catching the tail end of the UMass Amherst um, students off campus, that cluster. In our next calculation, um, the number of average cases is decreasing per day, but um, hopefully we'll be in the yellow this Wednesday. Thanks, Jim. Next slide. Again, we want to look at what the three colleges are doing. Um, and uh, there are links to each of the college's website. They maintain them uh, um, every day. Uh, the Hampshire does it every week. Uh, and uh, there's a, a lot of information on each of those websites. And the next slide. So this shows a little bit um, of what has happened. And I think the bottom. Um, chart shows the daily cases and how it, there was that spike in uh, early October, late September, early October. Um, and then it, it has been dropping off somewhat over the, over the course of the, um, of the month as we progress through the month. Jen, you're going to jump in if you have anything you want to talk yes. about. But we want to get to our other points. We'll, we'll race through these next few slides. Um, so again, the one thing I want to mention here, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it last time, is that what we're seeing a little bit now is our, our operations are all really solid, still working uh, well. We are seeing some incidents at the Department of Public Works um, where they've had some absences due to COVID, either someone, their a person's child being exposed in a, at, from a play group, and then they have to um, quarantine or some other thing like that. So until they re are cleared, they have to be um, they can't be on the job site. But that's really been the only uh, real um, noticeable impact on our staffing. As you know, force protection is our number one um, goal with our staff because it's through our staff that we deliver the services to the town. Um, and we were very concerned, obviously, about our emergency medical services, our police services, our water treatment and wastewater collection systems. And fortunately, and, and of course, the town hall um, finance offices and the town clerk's office um, so thank goodness those they're all maintaining their their healthy and uh, their that they're they're healthy. So, next slide, please. Uh, moving forward, we continue to do we we started up our weekly call-in shows um, a week ago, and, um, and Jen was on it last week. We had the town clerk, the acting town clerk, uh, and our facilities manager on it. We're going to continue with these um, every weekly every week and. Bringing on whoever is, is topical. Uh, we're hoping to have the superintendent on for Thursday if he's available, um, and, or we'll pivot and uh, bring someone else on if that's not available. Um, and we'll just move on to the next one. So, recent updates. Um, so, we all know that the schools reopened on Thursday, and it was a very successful reopening for kindergarten and first graders. Um, the, the students were um, back and very happy to be back. The, the staff were back and very happy to be back. Um, they, this, they, are, they have certain metrics that are set up that they have to follow. And this is a week by week thing. If their metrics, the way they've agreed to with the, with the union dip down, they will be forced to close. So that's a, that's a week by week basis. Um, but I think they have a pretty measured approach um, to how they're doing this. Um, but it was, it was, I was at, at uh, Crocker Farm School and then Fort River, and it was just 
you know, talking to the teachers who were very, um, they just said it was good for my soul to be back in the classroom with my kids. And it was, it was, it was very heartfelt. So it's good to see that. Um, licensees, the Board of Licensing Commission met last week and voted to reduce the license fees for restaurants on premises um, for all alcoholic and beer and wine restaurants by 40%. Uh, and those uh, renewals will go out on November 1st. Um, the university has offered testing for first responders, which includes our, our core facilities like wastewater and water treatment, people who are responding to emergencies, so, um, and police and fire as well. So that has been worked out very quickly with the university. Um, and so we're working on a memorandum of understanding, but they've opened up their doors to our staff and they have um, set them all up with their Google accounts and everything's moving forward. And I think we mentioned last time about our Department of Transportation uh, grant that we received um, last week. So next slide. So the other thing is that we came out with last, um, last week was our tips for Halloween. And pe many people are asking us for, for tips and, and communities are all over the map on this. Some towns, some cities and towns say it's not a town function. We're not issuing any guidance. Um, we, did, we felt like we weren't giving guidance. We were giving tips, which is a little bit lower level, I guess. Um, but really just to use common sense, encourage people that, you know, not going out is probably the safest um, uh, procedure, but if you are going to go out, follow certain um, guidelines. We also provide guidance for people who wanted to participate um, as, in your home as um, at Halloween. And the basic uh, metric I'd like to use is to say, if your porch light is on, you're welcoming um, people who might be coming to your door. If your porch light is out, that's a, that's a signal that you're not participating in Halloween this year. Um, and you know, we basically looked at what other communities were doing and tried to look at what the CDC and the Department of Public Health was recommending and put some, just some guidance together for or some tips um, for people to know what, what to do. Next slide. So this is where Jen and I wanted to sort of talk a little bit more um, because we're, we believe that we're going into a, um, a, a more difficult time of the pandemic and, um, Dr. Ulsterholm was on Meet the Press yesterday and talked about these are the darkest um, six to 12 weeks of the pandemic that he saw, mainly because of people being inside, people f having the sort of um, pandemic fatigue um, and letting their guards down. And, um, and so our concern is that we will start to see some more community spread and that's already being, there's a bit of an uptick in the, in the Commonwealth. And um, Jen, did you want to weigh in on this somewhat? Yeah, you know, I, I try to, I, I do keep up to date with journal articles. I'm also listening to podcasts um, from Harvard press conferences. So I'm really trying to keep up to date so I can report back to you and make you know, judgment and decisions um, on what we're hearing. And really, I'm, we're he hearing things like this is a period of heightened concern that we're going into. So part of that reason is like what, what Paul was referring to, that we have holidays coming up, family gatherings, people are getting fatigued, feeling we did so well over the summer, we can sort of let our guard down. But really, there's, this is the time where we just really cannot be slacking off. I think if we use really strong public health messaging, that the tools that we have, this is what we have, and we need to continue to use them, be vigilant, stay vigilant. And what those tools are, are the things that we know. Until we have a therapeutic, Maybe we'll have a better therapeutic, you know, medicine to treat COVID before a vaccine. Hopefully we'll have a vaccine, but we don't know. So what we do have is social distancing, reducing density, face masks, um, being outside, and uh, these other, you know, hygiene uh, measures. So I think going forward, really good communication um, and again, public health messaging uh, to really, you know, make sure that people can get together, um, but do it safely. And not just get together. I mean, there's other obviously forms of, you know, society we need to keep going, 
Um, so I think we can do it, but again, I just think we need to really be um, uh, heightened awareness now. So I know there are questions from the council, so we wanna leave time for that. Right, uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up. So <clears throat> this builds on something that I was hearing on the, the television today. We hear the numbers of cases, but we don't have much sense of the illness, particularly at this time, as opposed to the early days in the spring. And so of all of the people who have tested positive in Amherst, have any of them been hospitalized? Have any of them been in intensive care? Um, I, I think I feel, I mean, I'm being very good, obviously. I'm, I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do, but I feel the need for this to feel a little bit more real because great sacrifices are being made such as things like Thanksgiving dinner and family things. So I, I'd like a, a stronger sense of what really is happening with COVID in Amherst. Well, um, you know, we report data um, on our very small dashboard, the active cases, and then the, the running total. Um, we have the ability to expand the additional demographics and data, that's something that will need to be decided um, here or with Paul. Um, one thing that we can do, and I wouldn't be great at doing this, but you know, for Hampshire County and the state, you know, we have data on the number of hospitalizations, um, surge capacity and deaths. Um, so that's not much of an answer for you, but um, I understand your concern. It's, it's also for, you know, dealing with the whole, what they're calling COVID fatigue. If it's not real, if it's just, oh, I'm positive, and then like, I felt better, I stayed uh -huh. inside, and it was over. It, it doesn't keep us moving um, in the right direction. Um, so I, I just feel a need for more information. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I think, you know, we have these great statisticians and epidemiologists, but, you know, let's use our public health messaging. And, and I think that's an important piece right now. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. You have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I gave Paul a bit of a heads up of what I was going to ask him tonight, and I know he can't provide the answers tonight, um, but I'm hoping he'll be able to provide some information about when we can get this information because I think it's really important for the public to hear. Um, as you said, it was good for the school. Kindergarten and first graders went back to school five days a week starting last Thursday. The school had metrics. They followed those metrics and we can either agree with those metrics or not, but they had them, they put them out there and they followed them. And it was good for the soul for the kindergarten and first graders. And I will say as a parent of a seventh grader, it would have been really good for the soul of that seventh grader to be in school last Thursday. And like I said, we can agree with or not, but we knew what was happening and we know they're being followed and we can look towards a date where that seventh grader can get back to school if we can keep those metrics where they are. We have not heard a single metric from you about when our public buildings that are non-school related might be open to the public, whether they be libraries, bank center, senior center. So I think it would be very helpful to the public to hear what those metrics are, not just when it's safe. Um, is it a positivity and testing number? Is it a Hampshire County um, per 100,000 number? Is it something else? And what is that based on? So I think it's time, we're seven months in, we've had restaurant indoor seating available since June 22nd. We've had retail browsing inside for bookstores and other things since June 8th. We've had DMVs open for the public to go get driver's licenses in person. So, so governmental offices open for public transactions for, for a while now. Um, yet our buildings are still not open and we've had until this UMass sort of cluster, very low numbers in Amherst. So I'm hoping you can tell us tonight when we will see those metrics so that we can start talking about what, whether we agree with them or not and what they're based on um, and start looking forward to being able to uh, do stuff in person. As I think I said in my email, a new normal, most people have already gone to the new normal. 
Um, in my life, I'm wearing masks everywhere I go. I'm going indoor to browse bookstores, to shop, to do fitness activities. I know we've got some other counselors, I think, that are going to fitness centers, wearing masks and doing everything. And we're not hearing in this part of the town or this part of the state about community spread being traced to those particular activities. The community spread is being traced from everything I've heard to gatherings without masks where people stay less vigilant. So if we can stay vigilant, it likely is safe, but I think we need to hear what those metrics are. I appreciate you giving the heads up on that, Mandy Jo. So, you know, I have talked with um, you know, Jen about it, and we, you know, as we know, we have the health director from Northampton on our uh, as a consultant for us to help us guide through this. And um, you know, re you know, I have to rely on our health experts as to what is the right way to look at this. And you know, when I look at what the decisions we have to make, it's about can I deliver town services successfully to the public, and by delivering town services, it means I have to have town staff that are healthy and available to deliver those services to the public. I had a scare um, about 10 days ago in town, maybe a little bit longer than that, where I thought someone might have ha had exposure to COVID. And that would have like, because of our staffing, um, it, we could, I was feared that we might have to depopulate the building in a significant way. Um, minimizing the kind of um, variables that our staff are exposed to. People are already exposed to lots of variables because they have kids in school. They're, they're you know, going into re to stores and things like that. So I, I try to do the things that I control. Schools are a little bit different. They, anybody who walks on their premises is required to have a mask and they, and, you know, they can control their environment. We could do the same thing. Um, but I think that the danger of being an, a building that's just open to the public is a lot different than having than than um, having things that where you can't control it as well. So we are looking at doing additional things, uh, you know, opening up the town hall for in-person contact for um, staff through a through a uh, a portal for the town hall. Um, you know, for the senior center, it's really the last place I think we will be looking to open because um, that is the most vulnerable population and putting that most vulnerable population uh, in danger is not something I'm willing to do. We have provided town services. Uh, we have provided elections at, at uh, 10 locations um, and we're able to do that successfully. When we have to do a, a, a town service in person, uh, police, fire, DPW, and elections and things like that, we do that. Uh, we have been, we've migrated a lot of our um, permitting online and people have been able to accommodate that. I haven't heard of much of a demand from the public to say, I need to come into town hall. Um, you know, I think, you know, almost all of the um, transactions that we have uh, instituted have been able to be, be done outside. Now, with the weather changing, that's going to change, and we need to accommodate that as well. So that's why we're building these new um, places for people to be to interact with with people at town hall. Um, so until we have you know a vaccine or herd immunity, um, you know, you know, I don't see us exposing the town hall just to open town hall doesn't make a lot of sense to me, um, unless it's because we I look at it as providing services. Are we able to provide the services that the public needs in a successful way? If I'm hearing that we're not able to do that, then that would be, we will change that. We'll look at that again. Um, and, the, and the fact of the matter, it's working for us for the most part. You know, we haven't had um, concerns from our employees. Uh, employees are coming to work every day and they feel safe in their environment. So looking at that, I, you know, a lot of this is conversation with their employees about how do you feel safe coming into the office um, and what are the uh, provisions, measures we have to put in place to help them feel safe coming to work every day because we need our employees to be able to come to work. We are, you know, we have some people who work remotely, but a lot of, most of our folks are working on site and, you know, because we're an in-person type of operation. Um, other communities have, have really put everybody out into the field and you know, are working remotely. Um, you know, what metric we would choose, I mean, I did ask, um, you know, it's like, will we use case count, will we use positivity rate, I mean, what time frame would we look at, we could look at all those things. I don't know, if, I'm not sure which one is the right one to use that would tell us 
this is a safe day today. So, I mean, we will think about that. I, I appreciate the, the sort of level of detail you provided in your your questions. So we will definitely look at it and th rethink it. It does make us rethink everything. So um, and I'll come back to you with more. Thank, thank you. I just want to respond very quickly to the, you haven't wow. heard people needing services. Um, well, many of those services are being provided other locations. Um, so for example, passport applications, passport photos that town hall used to do, you can go to the post office or CVS and get some of that. So that could be why you're not hearing about them needing them here is because people are finding others. That doesn't mean you can't, you're not, it, it doesn't mean you're not, not, you know, I'm not sure how to say this. Mm -hmm. It's a failure of service to provide. You're just not hearing about it because someone's finding another location. Others are, I, I would certainly say kids sports. Yeah. Um, and the things that the, rec the newly named recreation department um, um, provides are being provided in private. Um, and that doesn't necessarily help those of our residents who cannot pay the private fees for that. But you may not be hearing about those find people finding other locations to get them in and, and it being done safely. Let's see, you have your hand up. So at, I, I will try and be brief at the risk of being a sort of point counterpoint situation here since I see I'm the only other one with my hand up because I completely disagree with a huge percentage of what Mandy Joe just said. And I do agree with Paul in this particular instance. I would also point out that whether we agree with the limitations or the metrics that Paul has is really completely irrelevant actually. Um, it's the school committee had that conversation even though the state basically said it was up to the superintendent. I would argue that we we can complain all day about what we think the standards should be to Paul, and I'm sure he will listen to us, but that doesn't mean that we get to make the decision on any of those things. I am, however, completely sympathetic to the idea of some of the things like um, different uses of the library, right, in terms of being able to use computers, for example. We don't have a place for people to do drop-in computers. Totally get that one totally get the recreational opportunities. We, there's a reason we run a leisure service, which we're changing the name of. There's a reason we run those services. There are many in the community who've always told us it's foolish that we run those services, that it should all be done privately and we should just offer scholarships. But we as a community decided to do that differently. And so I appreciate that that's now an unmet need because there are a number of people who are not able to access that kind of thing to do. But at the same time, I find it really objectionable to say, well, I'm going to book shopping with a mask on, I'm going to the grocery store. Well, I'm not. And I don't think your relevance is any more important than my relevance on that particular situation. I know there are other communities out there that say, well, if the kids are in school, then we should all be meeting in person. And I come back to something Paul just said, which is, how do I provide the services? And now I appreciate what you said about, hey, they're, maybe they're going someplace else for some of those services. But if we can provide services safely without putting our employees at risk, just so that we can say, hey, you can come into town to pay your property tax bill when there's a literally no reason why you can't pay it some other way, unless you have a very specific situation, in which case we'll meet you in the parking lot or meet you in this little safe cubby um, somewhere in town hall. As long as I'm hearing, as we've been hearing, that town staff is doing everything they can to keep town staff safe and to provide the services, making the adjustments for the weather, which is going to be trickier. I see every reason for us to say, you know what, let's just assume nothing's open until next July. I think that's entirely reasonable. I think pretending that without a vaccine, that if you just go around with the mask, it'll be no problem is ludicrous. And I just cannot support insisting that that's a thing that needs to happen. I know I've been hearing this a lot over the last several months, and I just think it is completely unreasonable. In terms of the metrics, I'm not sure I even agree with the school's metrics, but again, you know, that's not my decision to make, And but my children would not be in school. Your child is desperate to be in school. My children, were they that age, would absolutely not be exposed to what's happening in school. So I think we need to remember the huge picture of everybody, and in the meantime, Paul's focus on keeping employees safe and not having, you know, because if one employee goes down, even with the protections you've got, there are pe other people that are gonna be affected. I really appreciate the way he's looking at that. So 
another report on what's being adjusted for the winter, right? When people can't just meet out in the parking lot. Now, as some things have been done, I think we'd all appreciate hearing that, but I am absolutely not wanting to hear that we're planning to open anytime soon. There are plenty of private employers that people are privileged enough to work for that are not insisting that they go back into the workplace at all, much less try and treat it as the new normal. Barbara. And just to follow up on that, right down the street at UMass, another very public institution, really the message is if you can possibly work at home or not, you know, come to the university, then you should do so. So I, I think that there are definitely conflicting, you know, there's conflicting information, but that's the message from the other huge public entity. So I, I have a question about the whole red, red, yellow, green, because it's based on 100,000, yes? That that's, yes. it has to do with the trajectory based on 100,000. Yeah. So uh, we all know that what our, our census count is around 40,000. So I, I think that that's, is that what it's based on, this census count or? No, the, the, the population for Amherst, yeah. Yeah. it's, I can give you the number. Yeah. It's 40,497.88. Yeah. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. number is from UMass Donahue Institute. You'll have to tell me more about the 0.88, but um, that poor person. <laughs> um, but certainly, my question is: Isn't the whole thing skewed, though, because we know that those many people aren't here right now because of the fact that the universities are and colleges are underpopulated? So, so, so it's kind of a weird, made-up thing, right? Because our that's not really what our population is at this moment. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot that goes into calculating these these epidemiological, you yeah. know, these these calculations. You know, incidence rate is, you know, we're loosely saying it's new um, cases, but I think you know it's new cases in the susceptible population. So I I just don't know all the the intricacies, and that's why it's fun and oh, that's not fun but i get a calculator out and i can probably you know predict pretty closely where we're going to be but we really leave it up to the state to have consistent information week to week so. um mandy johanneke yeah just just i, I want to briefly um in some sense, respond to Councillor Brewer, but also sort of ask the question a different way, different way. When we went into this in March, the whole point of staying at home and doing this was, as you even said, flatten the curve, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. And what I think most of us in the public assumed that to be was to allow for room in hospitals. Um, and it was not a stay at home until the incidence rate is zero. And there are no vaccine and no one will ever get COVID again. Um, and so I guess the question I would have is, if we don't have, if we're not looking at metrics of infections or what, is your new standard an incidence rate of zero? Or is there some, some level of risk this town is willing to take? I guess is, is the something that I think the, the residents should, should hear from you. If, if your risk tolerance for opening these buildings is not until everyone in town has been vaccinated, well, then that's not next July. That is never. Um, and we will never have a public building again. And unless Baker requires us or the governor requires us to have a public meeting in public, in person, we'll never do that again because we're never going to get there. Um, and so I think we, as a town, should be able to hear what our leaders um, standard is for, I guess it is technically a risk tolerance as to, are we waiting for 90% of Amherst to be vaccinated? Are we waiting for vaccines to be available? Are we only waiting for our town staff to be vaccinated? Are we, is it not even a vaccination? Is it as um, uh, Ms. Brown, our public health director, interim public health director just said, better treatments? You know, what, what is it we are waiting for? And that's something we haven't heard out of the town. Uh, Dorothy, Pam. I, I guess what I'm saying is, I feel I'm in a vacuum. I don't know in the town of Amherst, many young person or child 
who's been sick. I do not know of any old person who's been sick or died, uh, except for those that were in nursing homes. I read the obituaries. I don't see anyone saying died of COVID. And I, it's not because I think that maybe nobody's sick. I feel like information is being withheld and I think it's really hard to live this way when we don't know what's going on around us. Uh, Shelly. I'm sorry, Paul. Yes. Information is not being withheld. And I think that kind of conspiratory thing is really negative and not reflective of the way we've handled this public health pandemic. So, I mean, I think people have different tolerance levels. I think Manny Joe's right. We see that just nationwide and community wide. Even within Massachusetts, people have different risk tolerances. And I think it's fair to say, what is our risk tolerance? What is that? So, but I think um, because anecdotally, you, you may not know everybody who has it, right? So, but that's not a good metric for us. We can't, we can't work on who I happen to know or who you happen to know. We go to our health experts and say, what's your guidance on this? So just, I don't, but I didn't need to jump in and cut you off because I think saying that we were withholding information was just not a fair thing. I just feel that what I said got twisted, but I'll, I'll let it go. Okay. Shalini? Is this a good time to talk about the emails we received about uh, the concerns uh, in the gather about the gathering downtown um, where people were not wearing masks? Should I talk about that a little bit now? So there were two different times there were gatherings downtown. Uh, several of us have gotten emails about them or saw it ourselves. Uh, Paul, I you and I have discussed that, so why don't you share sure. was done or not done? So about eight days ago, there was an uh, anti-vaccine uh, debate or protest on the, just outside, at least what, what was reported was just outside the mask requirement zone on the um, north east corner of the town common on the other side of College Street. Uh, so if you are in front of, if you walk on that, if you cross College Street, it looks like the green for Amherst College is actually is still town land. It's still the town common. Uh, those individuals were there holding signs against um, requiring a vaccine. They were not social distancing. Many did not have masks, some did. Um, the second event was a, um, a, a pro-Trump rally and people who were protesting against the pro-Trump rally uh, many of those people were within the, the mask zone, um, mask requirement zone. Um, there was, were some incidents where the police had to respond. There were fender bender, things like that. Um, I think that people were saying, why don't you go and make them wear masks? And, and at that point, I think the um, assessment um, by the police was that it was really, you're, you're create, gonna create more of a friction time uh, versus, um, you know, trying to enforce mask wearing. We don't issue tickets for people for not wearing masks. We offer them a mask. We did not put our ambassadors in that situation either. Um, there were there was a lot of shouting and, and yelling back and forth, but not a real much of an incident there. There weren't actually that many people on the you know pro pro Trump rally, quite honestly, um, compared to some other things that we've had on the town common. Um, so, but it, it it I know how it. Um, when you drove by and you saw it, it was like a um, direct insult to the town. Um, I know that how that felt, but it didn't seem like that's something that we would intervene on. Shalini, you continue to have questions. I, can I just, I just wanted to make, uh, highlight uh, some things because I went back and forth with oh, some residents in our district and I just wanted to share that with everyone because I think there is that burning question or the frustration that why can't we enforce the mass for these people, the endangering everyone. And I know that Paul, you just addressed that, that the police uh, felt and uh, had the discernment that if they interfered or intervened or it would have escalated maybe the, the problem. And, and I just wanted to put that in perspective for some of the residents 
by reiterating that even in our district meeting in District 5, Darcy and I heard many BIPOC and other people's concerns about being over-policed related to masking. I know this is not an issue of BIPOC, but I can understand from the police perspective that if we are saying to the police that do not you know, intervene, then we can't have them intervening in some places and not intervening in others. And I think the approach we've taken as a town is of education and hence we have ambassadors. But then I can also understand that if I was an ambassador, I wouldn't want to go into a pro-Trump rally and offer a mask to people. So I just want to put those things out for residents to really think through that why these decisions are being made and there are a lot of complexity of issues and um, and just like if there were to be more of these things happening in the future, maybe we would have a different, we would need to think of an approach of how do we deal with it. But I think if it's just one off rally that people came and they left and there was no, you know, issue that we're, I think we're fine for now. Uh, Pat DeAngelis, you have your hand up. A uh, quick question. I probably should know the answer, uh, but uh, did the group um, protesting masks and also the pro-Trump rally have permits or permission to be where they were? And if not, uh, why not? And if they did, um, will they be given a permit again? So we don't issue permits for political rallies and political rallies are exempt under the governor's order for gatherings, not for mask wearing, but for gatherings. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so they, we, when someone asks us, would I'd like to have a rally on the common, we appreciate that they ask us, but we don't permit different um, political, any political thing, but we tell them, oh, well, if you want to be on the common, that happens to be that's when the farmer's market is. So they've already reserved it. We, you know, we try to inform people so they know where to assemble. And this has happened multiple times this year. And, um, and we say, could you go on the North Common instead? instead. And, and so um, there isn't a permit that's required um, for a political gathering. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time with regard to the COVID presentation or these issues? Okay, seeing none, then we're going to take a five minute break. We will reconvene at 8.25. A seven minute break. Please turn your video back on when you return. As you return, please uh, on show, <laughs> please uncover your video so that you show your face, your real face. <laughs> then I know you're here. Thank you. In another minute. Okay, I just want to make sure that um, as we come back, everybody is still connected. I will start with Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Darcy, you need to. Yes. Thank you. Lynn Griesmer, yes. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. I'll come back to George. Uh, Steve Shriver. I'm here. Andy Steinberg. Here. Sarah Schwartz. Here. Melanie Balmilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Okay, I'm waiting for George Ryan.
All right, uh, we're gonna get started. I'm sure George is going to be joining us. So we have three action items, or three items in the action area tonight. However, we're not taking actions on any of them. All of them will reappear again on our November 9th agenda. So let's get started. And we now have the opportunity for council discussion with regard to adoption of the master plan. Are there questions or discussion that the council would like to have at this time? Melissa. Thank you. I want to thank Paul and his staff for updating the memo that talked about the master plan history, the master plan primer, and the original memo did not recognize the vast and extensive role of the many, many people who volunteered to serve on the Comprehensive Planning Committee and recognizing that role and the amount of work that they did. And they, in fact, passed a master plan draft that they'd worked with consultants on over to the planning board. The planning board did not draft the master plan. Um, and so just in terms of that background, the reason I asked about that beyond the fact that we've talked a lot here recently about how do we get people to be engaged, um, there were between 12 and 28 members on that committee at any given time, and it met for many years, at least once a month to develop the master plan. And so my point being not only, yeah, yeah, so all the people who did that, which we do have to recognize, but more importantly, moving forward, I appreciate the timeline that they laid out because I thought that was really important that Paul and staff did that to show us, you know, what do we have to do to get ready to do this for 2030? And one of the things we'll need to talk about, perhaps not us exact us, but some variation of CRC in the future, at least, we'll need to talk about what kind of approach to take because they won't be working with oh, the most recent plan is kind of the SCOG plan, like uh, the master plan committee was. They will have something more current, but of course it will be decades old at that point. And the question is how much community engagement does Amherst want? Because I can guarantee you that if the amount of engagement we had had was the amount that most communities in Massachusetts use, we wouldn't have a master plan at all right now. So we needed a lot of community engagement, meaning a lot of volunteer committee members at the time. We might be able to do it a little differently this time, again, because we're not starting from as far scratch. But to think that it would just happen with planning department staff, the planning board, and a consultant is uh, naive. That's not how it's going to work if it's going to work effectively. So thinking about a way of meeting in the middle associated with how that can happen in the future, it's really just, you know, I know we're pushing it off a few years, which is great. And I'm the one who said in February, hey, we don't need to correct the minor errors. We can just move forward with doing the things people want us to do in town and, and make those things happen, even if they aren't perfectly slotted into the master plan. But I want us to be aware that that community engagement didn't happen because a consultant came. It didn't happen because we had good planning staff. It didn't happen because we had a planning board. It happened because we had an entire committee who met for years trying to figure out ways to make that work and made it happen. So please understand how incredibly complex that process is going to be in the future. That means at this point, of course, that we should just go ahead and vote to accept it and it's gonna be great. And uh, then as I, we've all been talking about making the actual things happen that we wanna make happen. Thank you, Alyssa. Are there other comments or questions or statements at this time? Darcy. Yeah, I I guess I would um, uh, just hope that at the point that we make a motion um, that we include that we are assuming that whatever we do is going to be, you know, various plans that are in process are going to be integrated into the master plan. So if we could include that in the motion, that would be great that, that we're going to integrate our climate action plan. We're gonna integrate our housing plan. We're gonna integrate all the different things that are currently in process. Um, so that that is clear that we're not just adopting a decades old plan as Alyssa said. Thank you. We'll work on such. We'll work on trying to make the emotion the motion reflect the 
fact that the master plan is a living document. Um, are there other comments or questions at this time? Okay, seeing none, then uh, again, it will come back up and this time for a vote on November 9th. We're going to move to wage and tip theft bylaw and the responsible employer public construction contracts and agreements for tax <laughs> bylaw. And uh, Mandy Jo, Pat DeAngelis, and Kathy Shane, who is not able to be with us tonight because of personal family, uh, issues and Lisa Clausen will be doing this. They're going to, to give an overview of why we do this and so forth. And then we'll actually talk about each of the bylaws. So I'm going to turn it over to the three of you and go for it. So I, I believe Lisa Clausen is going to start, but we're going to need um, the, the, slides. the slides up. Yes. There you go. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, counselors, for hearing from me. Um, so my name is Lisa Clausen. I, I live in Northampton, um, and I am an organizer with the Carpenters Union, and I'm here in that capacity. Um, I, I want to, as you can see, there are uh, just, I'm going to kind of define the problem of what wage theft is and, and why um, we have been working with different counselors to propose some ways to address the problem. So first of all, as you can see, wage theft can take many different forms. Um, and when workers are not paid uh, or not paid fully or not paid properly according to what they owe, um, wage theft often goes hand in hand with payroll and insurance fraud, as then payroll taxes are not paid or not paid properly or fully and um, uh, insurance, particularly workers' compensation, is often um, not paid for workers as well. Um, and particularly in the, in the construction industry, we see it a lot where workers are being paid cash wages. And so um, the payroll taxes are not being paid at all. Work comp uh, is not covering them. Um, the two um, biggest industries with problems in the state, according to the Attorney General, um, and uh, reports that, uh, that her office puts out are the hospitality industry and the construction industry. Um, and um, if you're interested in learning more about it, the Attorney General issues an annual report each year on Labor Day on the issue. And if you just, you can Google Attorney General Massachusetts Labor Day study and you'll pull it up and, and get more information on it. So the next slide is I'm good for. Um, so what the proposed bylaws are aimed to do is ensure that when public funds in particular are being used on projects, um, that extra care is given to ensure that there's no wage theft or that there are repercussions if there is wage theft. Um, and likewise with business licenses, when they're being renewed, it's looking at if there has been any problem with wage theft and having some, some recourse if, if there is. Um, to this end, with both bylaws, we really see them as being preventative and that by having consequences or repercussions, it helps ensure that employers are taking extra care to make sure that wage theft doesn't happen in their business or on their construction project. Um, and the bylaws really give the town tools um, to employ to um, to address the problem if there are workers coming forward um, and that they are hearing that wage theft has happened on a project or in a business. Um, and I guess I would just end with saying that while the Attorney General's office is the main office in the state that, goes, that addresses wage theft and there are other um, state offices and federal, um, federal entities, um, the Attorney General has supported municipalities taking on this issue to help expand the tools and expand the protections for workers and preventative measures against wage theft happening. Um, the amount of wage theft that ha the amount that gets caught is unfortunately only a small amount to what is likely happening because many workers 
um, if they experience wage theft, don't know where to go to take action or don't feel safe taking action, as, as Jasmine uh, spoke to in her uh, testimony in the survey they had done of workers. Um, and, um, and so um, we do appreciate that the town is taking up looking at um, putting some more protections in to prevent wage theft from happening when tax dollars are being spent on projects or um, businesses are getting licenses in Amherst. Thank you. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the wage and tip theft bylaw does. And so this is the one that that really is the one of the forces for protecting workers not geared towards just municipalities. So this is the one that promotes knowledge of knowledge for the employees. Um, it allows our human rights commission and our human rights director to educate employees and employees and employers for seminars and workshops and other things. It requires businesses to post wage and tip laws, tell employees about their rights and give employees information in a timely manner regarding their schedules and pay rates and stuff. So it really allows the employees to know what their rights are um, and know what can and can't happen to them if they complain about their rights being violated. It also promotes compliance with wage and tip laws by using our licensing authority, the town's licensing authority, particularly around alcohol and meal service to ensure compliance. So if a business is found by the AG to be violating state wage and tip laws, the Board of Licensing Commission could find them, could revoke their license, could require a wage bond to keep their license, which is basically a wage bond, basically insurance that would assure employees that employees get paid if their employer violates the law. It's, it's, it's kind of like that type of insurance. And so it's, it's a way to try, this bylaw is a way to ensure that employees know what they can and can't do, have additional information, know where they can come on a more local level to make a complaint um, that would then be forwarded to the AG, but, but they might know someone in town hall that they can, they can make a complaint to. And it allows um, entities like the unions and the Pioneer Valley Worker Center to be able to refer them to a more local person than the AG's office that could be very intimidating um, to make these types of complaints and, and get their issues resolved. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Pat to talk a little bit more about this. You're muted, Pat. Yes, I just unmuted myself. Thank you, Mandy Jo. Um, I'm not sure where to go with this exactly. Um, in terms of the wage and tip theft bylaw, I've been doing some reading uh, and I'd like to quote a, a restaurant worker, if I might. Um, Carol Dunn, who worked for years in, uh, as a waitress, uh, was not receiving overtime, yet she was required to come in early to open the restaurant and to stay late to close it. And she says, I was afraid to ask for anything extra. Um, there is a real fear factor in saying something. And when she finally did, with the support of a worker center, uh, ask for um, her overtime, asked to be paid fairly, she was abruptly removed from the schedule uh, in a restaurant where she had worked for many years. Um, so in terms of wage and, and tip theft, uh, we really need um, to understand that this is a pro this is a problem that needs to be addressed directly, and one of the best ways we can do that is by uh, having license um, um, withdrawn, having the uh, wage bond, et cetera. And Mandy Doe, did you want me to go on to uh, you were going to do? I'm not sure I where. I can summarize the other bylaw. Yeah, and then, I and thought then you were going to do. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the next slide yeah. then. And I'll focus more on the legal stuff. Yep. So the next one, as, as this is, this is two bylaws actually, because it got really cumbersome to try and put them all in one. So the second one is a, what we call the responsible employer bylaw. And it really means that we in the town want our town money 
going to those employers who are responsible and don't violate state wage and tip laws and pay laws. And so this one has two parts, public construction contracts and agreements for tax relief. And what it does is it promotes the responsible use of taxpayer funds. So it requires when the municipality, when Amherst is contracting for construction services, it would in require certain clauses to go into that contract. So this is like if we, the contract we have for the building of the dog park or Kendrick Park, or if we ever get there, a new fire station. And the, the construction, the general contractor contract would have to have these clauses in it. And it would also for tax relief agreements also require clauses into those tax relief agreements. Um, and those, those tax relief agreements are, you know, we had one up in North Amherst in the mill district. And that is when we say, hey, if you build this, this private building, we'll let you pay less taxes for a certain amount of time to make it more um, affordable for you to build something because it's something we want built. Um, for this, for the one in the mill district, it was affordable housing. And, and that type of agreement would also require these clauses. And those requires, those clauses would require the sponsor for tax relief, but all contractors in a construction contract or on the tax relief project, all subcontractors on those projects to comply with wage and hour laws. Um, it would, um, it would say that if you don't comply with them, then there are um, penalties um, if you're violating the law and if you're found to violate the law. Um, and those penalties could be monetary damages for breach of contract, revocation of the tax relief that we granted them, um, you know, clawing back already paid tax relief potentially. Um, and then it also, those clauses also promote diversity of a workforce through encouragement, encouragement language, not require language, but encouragement language about um, the employment of veterans, women, and minorities. Um, with, without those not meeting them would not come with penalties. And it also promotes the hiring of Amherst residents and then Pioneer Valley residents um, instead of residents from say Eastern Massachusetts. Um, and again, there wouldn't be penalties for not meeting them. They would just have to prove that they tried them. And so what this does is promotes equal playing field and make sure our tax dollars are not being used um, to support businesses and con contractors that are not paying their workers. Next slide. I don't, is, Pat, do you want the next slide? Uh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, actually, go ahead, go to the next slide. Yep. And that was a listing of municipalities that have these kinds of contracts and, and ordinances um, covering tax relief agreements or TIFs um, and uh, diversity goals and their provisions. and. Uh, these are particularly things that we need to look at because they're things that KP Law was questioning. Um, we have municipalities like Somerville, Lynn, Northampton, New Bedford, Chelsea, et cetera, et cetera. We have uh, municipalities with diversity goals. Worcester has higher goals than are being proposed in these bylaws. East Ampson has the same goals. Springfield requirements uh, sim are similar or or higher than Amherst for residents of, of color and women. And the Boston requirements, not goals, are pub in public and private con uh, contracts are higher than Amherst for residents and people of color. The Massa you know, all Massachusetts, UMass Amherst, Mass Gaming Commission, public construction work and gaming bids contains goals for women and people of color at the Amherst level. Um, and in UMass Amherst and the Mass Gaming Commission enforce these levels uh, aggressively. And to date, there have been no legal challenges. Um, and we can, I think we can go on to the next slide. I think this one's me again. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so what, what our goal as sponsors with Kathy, you know, we're sorry Kathy can't be here tonight, um, but um, that we're trying to support our community. We're trying to reduce the unfair competition of a bidder that follows the wage laws, losing out on a public contract bid because someone that 
knows they're not going to follow it can put in a lower bid. Um, we want to increase the knowledge of the rights of workers. You know, we heard in you know public comment that there was there was the UMass professors started with a study where a third of workers reported they're afraid of being disciplined or fired for speaking up on safety and their rights. And we want to we want to make sure they know they can't be. Um, and that the employers know that if they do, they're going to face problems and they're going to face penalties. Um, you know, so so we're, we want to give the town tools to ensure that our residents and our workers, whether they're residents or not, are paid for the work they do. Um, and that taxpayer funds for Amherst taxpayers aren't used in jobs that aren't paying workers for the work they do. Pat? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I believe that was the end of the slides, or do we have one more? Yeah, I think that's the last slide. I think that in terms of wage and tip theft, uh, we, this bylaw would in, uh, include licensure authority and fines to enforce labor laws and would focus on service industries, such as restaurants and other hospitality industries that include tips in addition to wages. It would involve our Human Rights Commission and a uh, human rights director when and if one is hired in, again in Amherst. And they, their goal would be to educate employers and workers, referring workers to state authorities in the event of a, a potential violation, and providing penalties should the uh, attorney general find violations and require the posting of rights in all establishments and information on how to report a violation of, or file a complaint. Um, these bylaws, both the wage and tip theft and the responsible employer, would enable Amherst to exercise its purchasing, taxing, and licensing power to ensure that firms doing business in Amherst comply with labor laws. Um, we've met throughout this, we've met with town staff, we've met with the business community as represented by the chamber and by the uh, um, bid, and we've met uh, with workers um, across the board uh, in town and around in, in service industries and in construction. Mr. Alvarez was working on a project in Amherst when wage theft occurred. Um, and I won't speak further to that and I think he can do that on his own. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we also had a review by KP Law, we had more than one um, we had the first one involve them sending us information, and then we had a meeting with uh, um, Lauren from KP Law and GOL, and then uh, Mandy Jo and Kathy and I met with uh, uh, Lauren from KP Law in privately, and KP Law's focus is very specific, and it and she it is a focus that tries to, is very, as Lauren would say, is very, very conservative and very concerned about any possibility of a town uh, ha being sued for anything. And I think that um, what she found was that we are not in conflict with any state laws and that in fact, municipalities have the right to, um, I'll, I'll quote, they have, they really have the right to um, add to state laws. When I was talking to uh, Bill Newman from the ACLU, one of the things he said is when a law is created, a bylaw or an ordinance, one of the things, if, if state law already has a law, that law can be more restrictive than what a town creates. And then the town benefits from that restriction. But if the state law is not uh, as strong as it needs to be, a municipality has the responsibility and the ability uh, to add to uh, th their bylaws in terms of wage theft. Um, and that, that in, in fact, the state recognizes um, and may, doesn't make exclusive the process of establishing the requirements for a contract, et cetera. Um, and I can go into more detail about that if you have more questions. Um, is there, um, 
I don't know whether to stop here and address all the issues that the issues that were brought up through the discussions, or should we open it, Mandy Jo, to questions and comments? Maybe open it up, and, and if the, and there are any, you can address them. I just want to say one final thing, um, which is I want to thank Lisa Clausen from the Carpenters Unit Union Rose Bookbinder um, and Margaret Sawyer. Um, from Pioneer Valley Workers Center because they really helped us as sponsors get this to, to today <laughs> and we couldn't have done it without them. And I want to say one more thing because uh, Amherst in many ways uh, around town government has stayed divided and so we had uh, Pat, myself, and Mandy Jo, who represents one side, and then Kathy and I, who represent another. We worked in, um, in harmony, in the sense of really collaborating, really questioning, really challenging each other. And I feel like what we came out with um, was much better than any one of us or one side. Uh, could produce. And that's something I'm looking for is how do we work together? Um, and I, I don't know. So I want to thank Mandy Jo and I want to thank Kathy for our work. Back at you, Pat. <laughs> so um, this all actually started when Lisa and her colleagues came to the town and said, we'd like to see if you're interested in this. And um, as I do with any number of things, I kind of threw it out there and Pat and Mandy Jo and Kathy picked it up and a lot of work has gone into this. Um, and by the way, we will at some point hear from both the town services committee and GOL with regard to their review of each of these. But what I'd like to do in, is see if there are specific questions about the wage and tip theft bylaw at this point. Dorothy. I, I think I know the answer. I just want to be sure. Uh, thinking back on my youth, uh, as a waitress, I had to come in for one hour before work and one hour after. Before, and, I, and you couldn't, ch you had to check in the, the um, you pay your, your card in the machine after that hour and before that last hour. So we had to set up and we had to clean. I never got paid. Um, that was when our hourly wage was 75 cents with tips you had to sign. Um, still, it was a good job. Um, then a little later, I was uh, in Aspen, Colorado, cleaning hotel rooms at the Aspen Institute while I was at the Aspen Mus Music Festival. And when a very famous woman asked me if I'd gotten the tip she left me, I said, no, what tip? And we had a meeting with Big Rose, Big Ruby it was, who said her brother was a sheriff, had all the girls, and she said, I take those tips and what do you want to do? What do you want to make of it? So, you know, the only answer to that is to quit, uh, which I did. So would that taking of tips and, and just claiming them, would that um, having people work and then punch in, uh, those would be covered in this law? Okay, good, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Andy Steinberg, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, I really, I appreciate all of the work that has gone into it uh, by the three sponsors and by Lisa and the committees that reviewed it, of which I'm one of them, which is GOL. In doing that, it, um, there were several things that came to my mind that were uh, questions that I had. Uh, this isn't a statement in any way that I'm going to vote no, is, but it are questions that I have. And as far as this bylaw is concerned that we're talking about right now, when I read the memo uh, that the committee put together with a number of appendices, including a Q&A and statement from, in the letter that was written to the Attorney General, from the Attorney General to Lynn, the um, Q&A um, has the statement, the Attorney General's office doesn't have enough investigators to adequately stop the problems. And then uh, the letter from the Attorney General to Lynn says, uh, we were unable to investigate and take enforcement action in every case. 
So that raised the question in my mind as to what the staff cost and um, in, uh, including consultants that we might hire uh, is going to be to enforce this bylaw and whether there has been any financial impact um, investigation that is done, including inquiry with other cities and towns that have had the experience of administering this bylaw for a period of time to the not to advocates i want to know from the if, whether anybody has talked to any of those towns and said what has been your cost i believe Lisa is planning to address that question is that okay pat and mandy okay yes you could go ahead sure um so some town um the the issue of the attorney general not having enough um uh, staff for enforcement is a, a constant budget challenge and it's a budget challenge then for any community wor working to address the problem and there is an effort on the state level to give more resources to the attorney general to be able to work on this issue um, but regardless of that there's still going to be a need on the local level to um, to work on it um, but we un in certain communities where they have more resources, they have put staff into having compliance officers who investigate uh, complaints of, word, of wage theft. So Boston has staff that, that do that, uh, Springfield and Worcester do. Knowing that a smaller community like Amherst does not have, uh, we, we did not anticipate that Amherst would have the resources to, to work on in investigating wage theft. And, Similarly, uh, Northampton, East Hampton, other communities have not. Chelsea has not as well, even though it's a bigger community. Um, the way um, the, the bylaws are drafted are that um, it would not be Amherst staff doing investigation. It would be reacting and having some tools if wage theft uh, cases are brought forward. Um, so that is then you know, advocates um, going out and hearing of wage theft and bringing forward where a case that the state or some federal body has investigated or bringing people to the Human Rights Commission to look into um, what, you know, what has happened with that case. It gives tools to Amherst to then address it and to evaluate. Is this a, a case that makes sense for the town to take action? Um, uh, and conclude that there has been an adequate finding of wage theft um, and, and to then take action on it or, or not. Um, but currently right now, without these bylaws, for example, you know, with the Cowles Road project when wage theft came up, came forward there, the contractors that cheated workers and still in some cases have not paid workers from that project could just as easily um, bid on a school construction project and um, there would be no, they'd be treated no differently from other contractors who have not, who have played by the rules, who have not had a history of cheating their workers. And so this would enable that what this says is that the town would need to take a look at what the recent track record is, have there been problems of wage theft um, when they're evaluating it, but it would not be a, a cumbersome process or take um, the staff having to go out and investigate it themselves. Um, the, the contractors would have to submit um, affidavits um, sharing whether they have signing to whether they have been had a finding on them for wage theft in the last five years or not, and if they have what that finding was. Um, and for business licenses, it's just when they're up for license renewal they would have to share whether there have been any findings against them for wage theft, what those details are. And so then there you know, could be a wage bond that they're asked to purchase uh, to, to continue their business license. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, George Ryan. Thank you, Lynn. Um, one of the, I think, many good things that um, this particular bylaw does and that I think Mandy brought out and uh, Lisa's brought out, I think, also in her remarks just now, is the role of, of, of knowledge, of, of, of informing 
workers of their rights and making sure that they know what their rights are um, and that they have multiple pathways then to pursue you know, having that knowledge they can and then, then they know what they can do um, and what I notice in Amherst what I think about is that in particularly with the restaurants um, we have a veritable United Nations of, 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 of in that community and many languages um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering practically um, you know, and Lisa maybe has experience here and other communities, but again, we're a small town. On the other hand, we're a university town. How can we be sure that, that this knowledge and information, which is so important uh, for the workers, can be communicated to people, you know, who speak Vietnamese, Chinese, Spanish, uh, whatever, um, Cambodian? Um, and on the other side are the business owners, um, who also, many of them, um, English is not their first language, and American legal system is something that they they perhaps do not understand very well. So I guess it's just a practical question um, going forward, uh, as I hope this will will do. Um, how do we actually make sure that this important knowledge gets to the people who need it? Um, I know Spanish will be covered, English will be covered, but um, can we be sure, and do we have the resources to make sure that that uh, people who speak many different languages um, can get this knowledge. And also I think for the business community, uh, maybe working with the bid to make sure that, particularly for restaurant owners um, who, for whom English is not their first language, um, that they understand what this uh, bylaw is going to be asking them to do and what their responsibilities are. This is another, may I speak? Yeah, this hmm. is another time where the Attorney General's office uh, facilitates um, and municipalities. Um, and directly addresses language issues. Uh, all of the um, requirements of the laws, all the employer requirements are uh, on a poster uh, that the state gives out. Uh, that poster comes in Vietnamese, it comes in Cambodian, it comes in Chinese, Spanish, French, et cetera. Um, and so those uh, would be required to be posted in each restaurant. Um, also in terms, and I hadn't thought of that, but in terms of the bid and the chamber facilitating uh, possibly um, a meeting with restaurant owners or business owners to introduce these new bylaws uh, to them and, and to be able to um, do that with interpreters um, or required um, in required languages or needed languages at that meeting. Mandy Jo, you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I was going to mention the Attorney General's office. The bid, I think, when we met with the bid in the chamber, they expressed an interest in actually happy, helping to host in informational meetings with employers as well as employees, but mainly employers because they're an employer sort of um, representative agency. Um, we aren't requiring it in every language a worker speaks. Um, we, we decided that was one thing KP law had flagged and we changed it to English and Spanish, two of the most popular and, and translations that we have available um, in town staff. Um, and then a language, a language spoken that's by at least one third of the employees in the workplace. So we, we set a number that we thought was sufficiently high that it's not gonna necessarily catch the one-offs, but we'll catch those that are speaking, that are speaking a lot of any one language in that particular workplace. Uh, George, you have another question. Just quick, um, it's, the, it's the practicality of it, um, is, is what I'd like us all to keep in mind as we go forward, because um, this is an important thing, it needs to be done, um, but the knowledge has to get to the people, and so I hear exactly what Mandy's saying, and one third seems perfectly reasonable, um, but I just, and I also like the idea, again, of working with the business community, as well as reaching out to the workers so everybody knows what, what the rules are. Are there any specific questions about the responsible employer bylaw? Evan. So TSO looked at this uh, uh, June, quite a while back. And, and um, I'll say this, this is my opinion, not that of TSO. I think that we considered it prematurely because we did it before TSO had a process. And so one of the things, uh, the, one of the reasons TSO exists is to um, 
consider how any bylaw will impact the provision of town services. Um, and that involves a conversation with the town departments that will administer those services, uh, which we've done with every bylaw since, but did not do with this one. Um, one of the things I said as TSO voted on this uh, to recommend was that I was voting on it with the expectation that at some point prior to it coming to the council, I would get a, a memo from uh, the town manager about what procurement position was on this bylaw and how they saw the effects. Um, I heard from Mandy or Pat, I think it was Pat who actually said that they, they've talked, they have talked to town staff, um, but we have not received that information, including the members of TSO, um, whose job it is to think about how this might impact town staff. And so I'm, I, I appreciate that the sponsors have had these conversations, but given that procurement is the one who will be carrying this bylaw out, um, I'm questioning, and this is less a question actually, I think for Mandy and Pat, and more a question for the town manager as to um, what, what procurement's thoughts are on this, especially on some of the issues in here that were raised uh, where KP Law and the sponsors um, uh, contradict each other or, an, or, or are in opposition to each other. Um, because I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable moving forward on this without hearing from the town staff that actually has to enact this law. Okay. Paul, would you please address this? So town staff have met with the sponsors and, you know, uh, discussed what under, tried to understand more than what the bylaws intent was and what the requirements were and conveyed the sort of feelings of the town um, staff to the sponsors. We have not reduced that to writing. Uh, it's something we could do, but uh, we have not done that. Well, if I could just follow up, um, where that value would be is that if there are places where town staff have concerns, uh, it would be useful, I think, for the full council to know that. Um, and again, this is especially true, I think, with some of the areas where KP law expressed concerns. Um, are those uh, concerns shared where KP law expressed concerns, but the sponsors um, did not want to change the, the bylaw in response to those concerns. It would be useful to know where the people who actually have to carry out this bylaw stand on some of those disagreements or divisions between KP law and the sponsors. Paul, that would be a memo that you would have to facilitate with staff. And yes. we'll be looking at this again on November 9th. And so I'm asking if it would be reasonable to have a memo in advance of the November 9th meeting. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy, you have, uh, Evan, does that satisfy your request? Thank you. Uh, Andy, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, just real quickly, coming back on the first bylaw, we were talking about the wage theft bylaw. Uh, there were also, uh, the response uh, was talking about some of the uh, penalties that flow into the question of res the responsible employer sections of um, future contracts, but there's also a penalty um, that can be, um, levied if there's uh, proof of failure to comply, um, which I think is the right thing to do, but I think that we ought to know what the cost of that aspect of enforcement is too. As far as the responsible employer bylaw, um, I just wanna point out to everybody that on the one hand, when you look on the memorandum that the three sponsors prepared, for us and it says responsible bylaw would, and, and this is, was written in relation to both, ask winning bidders on public contracts to seek to hire a diverse workforce, uh, and which is, was mentioned by Mandy, but then earlier in the memo where it talks about at the very beginning what the purpose is, it says that the purpose is um, to strengthen Amherst's ability to assure that employers receiving town tax payer funds act and comply with state wage hour laws and to provide Amherst with tools to prevent wage theft. And so I th 
I find a little bit of confusion that comes because um, we started with the question of wage theft and then we layered in another important goal, but a goal that really was not about wage theft, it's about uh, uh, hiring practices and uh, that it just, I think it gets confusing because you put, if you're putting a second purpose that's getting layered on top of the first purpose without having had a discussion of it. I want to separate these two questions because Andy, I want to go back to your first statement because you implied that you're looking for something and I want to make sure we understand what you're looking for. Well, uh, Lisa gave a very good uh, explanation from other communities about uh, the ease of which it is to enforce this because uh, there's the ability to uh, not give future contracts and create penalties for future contracts. But it's really broader than that because it's also about license holders and it's about um, and uh, as well and it has to do with uh, penalties for uh, failing for for uh, wage theft uh, violations and so when we get into the cost of enforcement and question of um, staff um, time, committee time, uh, consultant time, town attorney time in actually uh, levying the fines and enforcing the fines and uh, representing in court if the fines are challenged, uh, which there is a right to do, uh, whether that has been looked at with the other communities that have similar bylaws, assuming that they have similar provisions. Okay, so I, I want to and just ask the sponsors, including Lisa in this case, uh, whether they would like to address that issue. I don't want to go on to the other issue yet. I could, unless one of Pat or Mandy Jo. Lisa Gunn. Okay. Can. <laughs> um, so, um, to my understanding and other communities of a similar size or slightly larger, um, it has, there has not been um, much staff time or cost to it. And I think it could be a question, I, I think we, with the worker centers help, could do some follow-up with Northampton um, as they did essentially all the different components that, uh, that Amherst has in their bylaws now, the licensure. Um, so, they have had several businesses that have come up for license renewal um, and have had a wage theft finding um, by an agency against them. And so they have then asked those businesses to get a wage bond um, and to secure one, which they have, to then get their renewal for their license. But I think it was to my understanding, but we can check and see about getting a memo from the mayor's office, from his staff in Northampton on it, that it did not require very much staff time. It was a part of the business license renewal process already. And the onus was then on the um, business to then put together the wage bond um, for a year's wages, given that they had had a past problem of um, not paying their workers properly. The idea is that that would then cover those wages were they to not um, pay them in the future. Um, and in terms of um, contracts, um, I, I can speak to that more clearly. What is asked of contractors is that they sign an affidavit um, that they have not had a recent finding of wage theft. Um, and then there's a process that um, the town could instigate if wage theft is found to happen on that job where the town and, and city council could then take up looking at um, was there wage theft, were there findings of it, do a hearing on it essentially, and, um, and then put into place some of the repercussions or the penalties for it. So 
on my understanding within Northampton, these are just signed by the contractors. They're another piece that are a part of what the procurement staff do when they're talking with a contractor's bid who secured the bid. You know, here's the paperwork you need to fill out as part of you know, securing the bid and they have added the wage theft um, component to it. They then file it. There's nothing that is asked of town staff to do. They file it, but it enables that information to be a part of public record. If someone to then were to go and challenge that and say, no, the, we, we do think that this contractor has uh, incorrectly filled out that paperwork and actually has a finding of wage theft. Um, and in which case, uh, so that hasn't happened um, in Northampton to my knowledge, but it's a process that would enable it to happen if it, were, if, um, if it were needed to. In terms of, but what it really comes down to is it's the general contractor who knows that this is now a component that they can't hire a contractor that's had a recent finding of wage theft. There are hundreds of contractors to choose from and this would enable them to, you know, they, they just would know there are certain contractors they're not gonna use um, because they've had a recent wage theft problem. And so in that case, that gets to what, what several people have talked about, the, the leveling of the playing field and making it fair so that companies that do follow the rules, that do pay the, their workers fairly are, are being you know, evaluated on being used against other contractors that are in a similar place and not contractors that hit low numbers because they cheat their workers. Andy, I'm going to go back and ask you specifically what it is you would like to uh, the, 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 What you didn't address, and, I, and Mandy may help me here too, um, there's also the ability to have the police department, the uh, Human Rights Commission, I think there was one other named, Le, um, levy a fine. And I think that it's a fine was a daily, if I recall, I'm not 100% certain on that. So there's a monetary penalty for um, that comes before they ever get to recontracting. And is that being enforced in other communities? And what is the experience in, um, that other communities have had if they have been enforcing such penalties? So um, there is no penalty in the responsible employer section. So, so, so there is no fine, non-criminal disposition or criminal disposition from that point of view in the responsible employer municipal contracts or tax relief agreement portion. All of that is based on breach of contract or breach of the agreement. Um, so the penalties are written into the contract or the agreement for that bylaw. Where you saw the, the, the sort of per day violation type things or per employer employee is in the wage and tip theft bylaw. We removed the criminal fine and the criminal action from that bylaw. So there's no more criminal disposition. There is non-criminal disposition. The first violation is a warning. And only after the first violation is there a $300 fine or fee per violation. Um, it can be enforced, you're right, by the human rights director, the police department, or the board of license commissioners. So if the board, if someone's in front of the board for a renewal of a alcohol license, and they, d during that, hearing and off and renewal determination determine that they have been violating this bylaw, the board could just issue those, those non-criminal disposition. I don't know whether they're called tickets or violate, they're just called violations at that time. Um, this, it, the wage and tip theft is not a bylaw that is intended to be, I guess, what you would call actively enforced. I think our town uses enforced upon complaint or something like that. I forget how our our um, our police chief refers to things like that. They're not going to be going out um, into a business specifically looking for failure to post the rights. But if someone comes to them and says, comes to the human rights director and says, hey, they don't have the poster up. The human rights director could walk over to the business, look to see if the poster's there, and if it's not, issue a warning. 
Um, yes, that'll take some time, um, a little bit of time from the human rights directors or the police departments, um, you know, time of day. Uh, but but that that's it's it's more of a enforcement on complaint. I don't know if that's answering your question, but it has that that penalty in the penalty block doesn't isn't in the contract municipal contract or the tax relief agreement bylaw those are you'd have to find a breach of contract so that would be you'd be alleging a breach of contract and you'd be into that type of enforcement already Andy, further questions on this issue well i i guess i'm just getting back to the question as to whether other communities with similar provisions have had experience in the costs of enforcement for it, for what we've now narrowed down to is, um, which I was trying to get at the fines. And um, if so, what the report on that has been, if there hasn't been an inquiry, then I think we've probably we've exhausted it and should go on. I mean, we oh, haven't specifically that have been done. Yeah, we we haven't as sponsors specifically gone to Northampton and say, "Hey, how many of these fines for wage and tip theft have you issued, and how much staff time did it take?" We haven't done that to the other communities that have adopted those. That we, we did offer to talk to Northampton and get yeah. some. Yeah, I, I will follow up with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then, Andy, you raised the other question, which was... Yeah, no, I was more pointing it out, and I don't really particularly um, want to get into the discussion myself, but I wanted to make sure that other counselors are aware that the initial statement on the top of the memo that um, Kathy Pat and Mandy Santos dated October 14th said, says the the purpose of the two bylaws is to strengthen Amherst's ability to assure that employers receiving um, town taxpayer funds comply with state wage hour laws and to provide Amherst with tools to prevent wage theft. And then uh, two pages later, expand that purpose and uh, to something that is really a different subject, an important subject, but a different subject. Um, and that's um, on hiring practices. And um, if people are uncomfortable with going into really a two-purpose bylaw, um, I think that I, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that it, it's really gone beyond, it goes beyond wage theft and into another subject. And I'll leave it at that. So um, Paul, I do want to ask the following question. In any other policy statements of the town, including bylaws, do we have targets, if you will, or percentages where we state what we should be in terms of hiring or what for contracts or anything like that in terms of minorities, women, people who live in an area or a geographic area? I don't think so. Okay, so this is the only bylaw and the only town policy in which we have some stated guidance on this. This is, again, as the sponsors have pointed out, it's not punishable, it's a guidance. Okay, right. Um, I could, sorry to interrupt. Um, no, go ahead. Yeah. I would add that, you know, we we have residency guidance for all of our boards and committees. We require them to be Amherst residents. Um, we require our town manager to be an Amherst resident. They don't have to be when they're hired, but they have to be within a year or something like that. Um, so we do have residency requirements for various um, positions in town. I do not know whether our police department. I know it's been common in the past for police departments and fire departments to have residency requirements. I do not know whether ours does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're getting no's to that, so. And I, I was really more after the issue of 
percentages, uh, particularly as they go, what the state guidance is at this point. And I'm also hearing that we don't have that stated any place else as policy. No, but we are matching the state guidance in right. this need bylaws. Right. Absolutely. And I, I would just add that um, the construction industry has been one that has been one of the least diverse industries um, in our country. Um, the military, police, fire, other industries that have traditionally been also not diverse in terms of gender as well as race um, historically across the country have made more progress than the construction industry has. Um, and so, yes, it's a, uh, Andy is correct in that these are two different issues that are together in one bylaw. And um, we have been, as uh, from the carpenter's perspective, as we advocated for this, wage theft is a big problem in our industry. And as we've talked to counselors and municipalities to address it, we've also taken that opportunity to raise that um, there is also a diversity problem in construction and, um, and we've been urging municipalities to kind of join in on helping fix that problem. And we found that where, um, you know, aggressive recruitment to change and address the diversity problem is something that many of us in the industry are working to do, but it really helps when they're our owners of construction work who are also requiring or setting goals in this case, our contractors to work towards um, more diverse um, uh, workforces. All right, uh, I'm gonna go on. Alyssa, you've been very patient. Uh, please go ahead. So, for the public, believe it or not, we've talked about all this stuff at committees a lot and tried to work out all these details. It's just that there's just more and more fine tuning and more questions that arise and maybe some that just hadn't been answered before. So I'm going to ask some questions that I just asked that be answered for our next meeting, right, rather than somebody trying to figure them out right now. The first is actually a comment based on what you just asked about, Lynn, in terms of what other policy statements or bylaws might we have that have targets or percentages. I just wanna point out that we have a TIF agreement with Atkins that says that we were looking for employees of the greater Franklin County economic target area and Amherst in particular. And that was something that KP Law complained about in their original memo. And I said, well, that's funny because we already did it once. And I know that uh, KP Law is not likely to say, oh yes, that was a terrible idea. But um, I don't know how that, you know, again, the reality is, like you said, we don't have a policy or bylaw that has targets, but we did in fact outline targets in a previous contract. So um, whether that was a good idea or not, it was certainly something we thought we thought was a good idea with whatever town attorney we had at that time to do that. Um, in terms of other parts of this, when it talks in the responsible, again, not expecting an answer tonight, when it talks in the responsible employer bylaw and says, defines tax relief and says means any form of tax relief granted by the town under a TIF agreement, and as we saw in the KP law and as some of us already knew, TIF is a very specific thing under state law or pursuant to any other provision of law or regulation authorizing the town to grant tax relief. So to be clear, which is like incredibly boring and in the weeds, but what we did with Beacon, North Square, is not a TIF. It's special legislation that we have in place that we are allowed to use for affordable housing, and we used it with them. So I just would like someone to verify for our next meeting that that kind of agreement would fall under that second part of the part pursuant to any other provision, right? As opposed to being a formal TIF under state definition. And it just means that we would have to write the contract with them in such a way that this would be enforceable. Whereas what contract we wrote with them before, we obviously believed there was not going to be wage theft or we would not have entered into an agreement with them. But from everything we've been hearing over the last many months, that's been problematic in terms of enforcing with subcontractors. And so we would in future, were we to do another affordable housing project with Beacon or anyone else, we would be able to write the contract reflective of this new bylaw 
that would then enable that to be enforced in a different way. So that's a good thing, but I just wanna make sure that that project, which is not a TIF TIF, but a different kind of TIF actually is covered and it sounds like it will be. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can answer that one now. Well, okay, but it would be good to, yeah, that's fine. It would be good to be clear about that just because when KP Law wrote, they acted as though we didn't have any TIFs and we have one special legislation and we have a couple of other actual TIFs. Yeah, no, we intend to, the, the bylaw is written in as an intent to cover, especially the special re legislation. Great. Uh, that's why the sponsors added the sentence about what would not be included in this, this definition okay. instead okay. of what is included. You know, the, the KP Law's recommendation was to say, except, and she added a big clause in there, and we had big concerns that that clause actually then took out the applicability for the special legislation and all. Um, so that's why there's that extra sentence that says this specific section of MGL does not fall under this. And that's the um, the tax sort of write-off type relief that we grant during budget season every year for veterans and, and um, you know, elderly, um, the over 65s, I think those types of special, you know, tax relief we're, we're saying this doesn't apply to. But it does apply to that. So great. That's the and end. then the other, I'm sorry, the other one I had is in regards to, and it was really just, again, a previous conversation at TSO. And then a couple of people, both the counselor and one of the presenters have mentioned the Human Rights Commission. The Human Rights Commission has a limited role here, as is clearly defined in the bylaw. It is a very useful role in terms of meeting with the attorney, the attorney general in terms of reporting type materials. It is not and has never been, and I have said over and over again at public meetings, yet Lisa mentioned it again tonight, that someone who believes they've experienced wage theft should go to the Human Rights Commission. That is factually incorrect. And it's still in Appendix D as being go to the Human Rights Commission. That's not correct. We, The Human Rights Commission is obviously subject to open meeting law and it would be ridiculous for someone to go to the Human Rights Commission and say at a public meeting, my wages were not paid by X company at a public meeting. I just, that needs to be removed from that appendix moving forward. I realize that's not part of the bylaw. The bylaw is very clear. It says human rights director, which then leads to my second point that I think needs to be addressed in some fashion prior to our November 9th vote, which is that we have not had a human rights director since Deb Radway retired from being both human rights director and human resources director. We do not have a human rights director with that title. So given that the bylaw very clearly talks about the human rights director's role, again, I don't wanna hear explanations tonight, but it needs to be clarified in a memo to the town council for next time and to the community how that's going to work that obviously it must be someone designated by the town manager for that sort of work, but there's not someone with that job title right now. And again, really, really strongly feel, as I'm sure you understood, that it's not appropriate to take wage theft complaints to the Human Rights Commission because they can't meet about it privately. They'd have to talk about it in public and that's entirely inappropriate. Okay. Any comment from anybody at this point? Paul, anybody else? I would just say we'll fix Appendix D. It was probably at one point it was yeah. to the NRC and we just exactly. we just didn't yeah. fix it when we yeah. ended the bylaw. We'll fix My, it. So the only follow-up I think coming out of that is to clarify who is in fact the designated human rights director from all of your three points. Is that correct, Alyssa? Got it. Darcy. Yeah, I just uh, have to say that um, our support for these two bylaws, or is it three? I'm not sure. I think it's two. Um, seems to me to be a, a, a no brainer. Um, as, as Evan said, TSO uh, took this up really early. We took it up on May 4th five months ago, um, and uh, we first heard it, we gave suggestions for for amendments, uh, which the um, 
which the, which the sponsors worked on and came back with the, the proposal uh, for the addition of the Human Rights Commission um, piece, uh, which had previously been a separate committee that was going to be created. So they changed that um, on our request. Um, but the reason that we took it up so early before we even had a review process was um, because of COVID-19, because of uh, the urgency of um, the needs of low wage earners during the pandemic. And now we see that the pandemic is going to go on and on for at least another year. And, um, and so it's particularly pressing to get this passed um, as soon as possible, in, in my opinion. We, we really want to support responsible employers, um, as, as the sponsors noted, um, and contribute to the health and well being of the workforce um, and community. We don't want those responsible businesses who abide by wage and hour laws to face unfair competition um, when others commit wage theft. And I really, really want to thank the advocates and the counselors who stepped up to sponsor these bylaws because it allows Amherst to really show leadership in supporting our low wage workers during this time and generally going into the future. Darcy, let me suggest that at this time, is there anything that you would like to add to your statement that would actually be your official TSL report on either bylaw? Um, well, on the 14th, the TSO did vote unanimously and to recommend it to the council before it moved on to GOL. Um, we made a number of suggestions in the first meeting, which, as I mentioned, the, the sponsors looked at and they came back with amendments um, for the May 18th meeting when we voted. Um, so I don't think we have, we, uh, I think, um, I don't really think I need to add anything more than that. Um, okay. Yeah, we uh, voted unanimously to recommend. Thank you. And um, George, I'm actually gonna go ahead and ask the same thing now for GOL, your, um, the statements for both bylaws whether I wish to add anything or whether it just to report. To report GOL's actions. Okay, um, good. Um, I, I wanted to begin by saying that I actually support this bylaw and I plan to, to vote for it, but that's uh, said in uh, anticipation of the fact that GOL is asked to look at the bylaw simply as a matter of uh, clarity, consistency, and actionability. And a key part of that is the legal review. So um, as you have perhaps some of you painfully had to wake your way through the GOL report, there's now two of them that spell out some of the discussion and also some of the areas of, of, of uh, difference between KP law and the sponsors. And as the sponsors made very clear this evening, they spent an enormous amount of time working with KP law, uh, both in the GOL meeting and also later and uh, came to, I think, uh, a fair amount of, of agreement, but there still remain some areas. And so what I tried to highlight in the second report are areas where there still remain some um, differences. Um, but uh, Pat was perfectly correct that um, the KP law did not identify any what's called sharp conflicts between this bylaw and state law. What they did point out, and it's in my report, um, and I'm sure you've all read it, is that there are areas where this could get sticky. Um, at some point. Um, so I don't have anything really to add to it. Um, it's, it's there for everyone to read. Um, bottom line is that uh, we declared it clear, consistent, and actionable um, by a vote of four uh, in favor and one abstention. Um, for and, both bylaws. I'm sorry. For both bylaws. For both, yes, for both bylaws. We did each bylaw separately, and the vote for each was four in favor none against and one abstention. So um, we've had a very healthy discussion on this tonight. 
uh, there's a couple things that we've asked that there'll be follow up on. And I've made note of those and I'll confer with the sponsors on those uh, before our next meeting. And uh, are there any final comments? Otherwise, this will come up again on November 9th and we'll have some answers to some of the questions that you've asked. I, I, I wanna thank all three sponsors and Lisa for bringing this to us. Originally, enormous amounts of work have gone into this uh, and Kathy will be with us on the 9th and we can get to thank her as well. All right, so then with that, we're going to move on. We've done appointments. Uh, we're going to do the committee and liaison reports. Finance committee is first. Andy? To skip CRC. Oh, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was all ready and it skipped me. <laughs> um, and, and, and in fact, there's not much to report. There's a report in your packet. Um, yeah, and I would just ask that you read that. Um, the, the report details, particularly one vote that CRC took to recommend that the council forward something to GOL. Um, I, I will be talking with Lynn about getting that on an agenda at some point. Um, and that relates to issues surrounding town council, multiple member body appointments. Um, as Lynn announced earlier, uh, CRC will hold a joint hearing with the planning board on November 4th at 8 p.m. The planning board meeting will start at 6.30, but the hearing that involves Article 14 and zoning bylaw will start at 8 p.m. Um, CRC next week will have a meeting at 2 p.m. and we'll be discussing zoning. Uh, probably Article 14 will be on that agenda. Uh, there's a possibility that 40R will be on the agenda, but I don't think that will be on it. I think it will just be zoning priorities and uh, Article 14. Okay. Uh, Darcy, you, you have your hand up. Question? Yeah, I have a question. I just have a comment about the CRC report. Is this a time to do to make that comment? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate that CRC debriefed its planning board interview process. Um, and I agree that a change in our process is one that the council needs to discuss. Um, I don't agree that the issue should be referred to GOL uh, because it's one of policy. Um, it, um, it will end up being one way of doing it or the other. Um, it's not, um, GOL's own guidance document states can GOL recommend substantive changes that alter the intent or function of a measure? No. GOL only evaluates proposed measures for clarity, consistency, and actionability. Doesn't evaluate policy. GOL will not recommend any revisions to a proposed measure that change the intent of the measure or its functionality unless GOL determines that the intent or function of the measure conflicts with Mass General Laws, the Charter, or the adopted town bylaws. Thus, I believe that this discussion that we need, this is a discussion we need to have with the full council and that any action start here. Um, then if we come up with proposed language that we can agree on as a policy or as a new rule of procedure or whatever, um, I personally think it probably should be a new rule of procedure. It would then be referred to GOL um, and but GOL isn't the body to recommend which policy to adopt. Okay. I'm just writing down notes, sorry. Um, right, is there any other comment regarding that, Alyssa? I agree. Then we will come up with a time to put that on the agenda of the full council before the referral. Okay. And I'll speak with different counselors who have more able to describe the process in full that was used before we go forward with that. And let me just try to find a time on the agenda for that. Any further comment? on that. All right, 
Now we can go to finance committee. Sorry, Mandy Joe, I didn't mean to slight you. Andy. Uh, the finance committee report is really the report that was provided and added to the packet on Saturday, along with several documents. And I had asked the documents be put in in advance because we were having problems getting the report into final form um, for a um, couple of reasons that I wish I won't go into. But um, in any event, the uh, report was really covering um, sort of our discussions about the fourth quarter year end report and uh, the process for the coming year and a little bit about the question of uh, the inventory. So um, I just will leave it as to whether there are any questions that come from um, either the, the report or any of those documents. And uh, if none, then I am finished. And Joe, you have your hand up. Yep. Um, just a quick question on the consolidated timeline. Actually, two questions. Um, the consolidated timeline has the council referring the CPA items to FinCom in May, it looks like, uh, maybe April. It's hard to tell. Um, and voting on the CPA stuff in June. Um, but the regular timeline said CPA was going to finish its report in December. So I'm hoping that we're not going to sit on a report for four months or five months, that we're going to actually do that referral in January and vote in February or March. Um, so maybe it just didn't get shifted when CPA's timeline got shifted. Maybe this consolidated timeline didn't shift that. And it would be really nice, the other comment on that is, it would be really nice if the consolidated timeline also included uh, capital. Uh, the JCPC functions because it does not include JCPC on this timeline at all. It says budget, but the capital budget, it, it includes it as part of town council um, presentation of CIP in April, but it doesn't include like a JCPC when it's doing its thing. Okay. Okay, thank you for the comments and uh when we have our next meeting, which will not be tomorrow as noted, but uh, when we have our next meeting, I will make sure that we get those reviewed again. That was submitted to us by staff and um, we talked about it some, but did not have uh, a complete review to the level and so your comments are very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, GOL, George. Uh, just note that we're meeting on Wednesday um, and that the main item of business will be continuing to discuss the council process for evaluating the town manager's performance and for setting town manager performance goals. Um, Mandy Joe, you still have your hand up. I think you might, yeah, thank you. Okay. Town services, Darcy. Uh, yes, I won't repeat what's in the report, um, except to say that uh, TSO unanimously voted to recommend approval of the FACE technology bylaw proposal. Um, we'll be speaking further to the Transportation Advisory Committee about how we can work together effectively. Um, and uh, that uh, important appointments for the Community Safety Committee are coming up at our meeting on, I believe they're coming up on October 29th, although I have not confirmed that with the town manager. Um, the, uh, and as we mentioned earlier, the October 22 meeting is postponed until 4.30 p.m. on October 29th. Thank you. Um, are there any liaison reports? Okay, we've done the approval of minutes. Uh, town manager's report, Paul, highlights? Yes, um, so first off, the elections are happening. Uh, the voting is happening. We had um, early voting starting at the Banks Community Center on starting on Saturday. Uh, over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday, we had 236 people vote, some of the counselors who actually voted as well. Um, we also have a uh, the voting ballot, if you wanna, hand, if you wanna put it, uh, 
your ballot. If you don't want to go through early voting, you can drop it in the drop box that's on the main street side of town hall. That's also available. Um, no real um, problems over the weekend, although there was a line pretty consistently. So the people are e eager to do the early voting, which we're very pleased about. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, um, so that's the big thing we're focused on. I am, we had the first meeting of the interview team for the community safety working group, really good meeting for that group. Um, and uh, so worked on a number of the questions that they would like to ask, the process that they would like to use during the interviews. Um, we're now s securing actual interview times over the course of the next week so we can interview all the applicants and getting this pretty talented group together for big chunks of time is we're going to, it's going to take multiple hours of their time to be able to interview everybody who put their name forward. So we thank the people, these, these folks for dedicating their time to this. Um, so those are the two things, the big things that I wanted to mention. If there are other things that you have questions about, I'm happy to answer them. Sure, can you your hand up? Yes, um, there is a small confusion, uh, which we may have contributed to. Um, Bob and I went and did early voting on Sunday. And we were asked when we were in line by the poll workers if we had taken out a um, absentee ballot. And we said yes. And then they had to call town hall to say, put a stop on that when they're going to vote in person. So um, the people after us, when they were asked that question, said yes. And here they are. And so all that they had to do was to give their empty, unfilled out ballots to the poll worker. So Bob sent out a, a memo, but some people have been uh, getting confused. So I believe this is correct. And please correct me if I'm wrong. If you have filled out your absentee ballot, you can take it in person to the drop box, uh -huh. but you do not take your filled in ballot to the early voting. But it would save the town uh, workers a lot of time if you took your unfilled out absentee ballot with you, if you go to vote in person, and then they will take it, and that way they know you're only voting once. Because they have to, they will be, they're going to check on every um, absentee ballot that has been sent out to make sure that, that each individual only votes in person or by absentee ballot. Is that absolutely correct? Yeah. So, um, on the list is a designation if you've requested an early voting ballot. If that if there's that EV designation there, they need to ver verify with the town clerk's office that that hasn't been received by the town clerk at this moment in time. So if you so that you only get to vote once, and so you can either do early voting by five, by giving you the envelope or doing it at early voting in person. So they will verify whether you've done which one you've done. If you, if you have the ballot, that's fine. You don't need to have the, the blank ballot with you. If you have a filled in ballot, you can't take it to early voting because you put that in the drop box because they can't accept a filled in ballot. That's only for in-person voting. Right, so, but my point was you could save some people some work if you brought your empty ballot with you, which I, which I had done. Yeah, you, it, it might save some time, but I think they would still validate that with the clerk's right. office. Um, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yep, just a couple of questions. I was wondering if we know, thank you for the numbers for in-person early voting. I was wondering if we know what percentage of all resident, all voters have already voted, um, including the uh, absentee and mail-in early voting ballots. Um, so that was one question. What, could you update us on the status of the strategic partnership agreement negotiations um, with UMass is number two. Emergency rental assistance you talked about in your um, memo, your report, uh, could, do we, is it, is it allowed for us to know how many families have benefited from that program right now? Like how many have been awarded? Um, and then just a, a sort of a housekeeping travel thing, West Pomeroy Lane or road or whatever it's called, um, where there was a lot of construction going on and the road is torn up. It is a moonscape and dangerous to drive on. Um, so when will it get paved? I know you might have to have it sit, and if it's not going to get paved for a while, it needs regraded very badly. Um, so West Pomeroy Lane has been the site of numerous water main breaks, and you know they've been investigating why. You know that that has, that that road has blown out several times, and it's usually uh, um, 
something wrong with the pipe and we were there they've done a lot of investigation there seems to be like an electrical current or something that's grounded in there so um they've done a lot of different things so they just decided to replace the entire thing and so that's going to take some time and that should resolve that um that challenge i don't know how when the paving is is going to be done but i can find that out for you yeah. um you have to remind me the, the other points strategic partnership agreement no progress on that um not a lot of interest at the university level to talk about beyond what they've already committed to with the schools. And I don't think this is the opportune time to be asking the university at this moment in time, but it's not off of my radar screen at all. Um, and uh, remind me of the other two. The emergency rental assistance, just how many families, and then if we have a percentage of how many people have already returned. Anyway. So emergency rental assistance, there was a, a report given to the Affordable Housing Trust on Thursday night. I didn't write down the numbers. I can get that number for you easily. Um, it was it's a um, it was less utilized than we had hoped, and we discovered some reasons why. Uh, more people started to fill out the application than finished it, so that is an indicator that either the application was too, too complex or for some reason, people got to a point and stopped filling it out. So that was something that the Affordable Housing Trust had talked somewhat about. Uh, in terms of number of people, I know that um, about half the people have requested um, early voting uh, as, meant as terms of how many turned as have turned in today. I can find that out. They, we keep a track. We do keep track of that. Okay, thank you. Kathy Andrews, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, two meetings ago, I asked about the ambassadors, and I know your report reflected today that it is fully staffed now, and I'd like to know how many people were hired to be ambassadors. Uh, do you have that number? I do, 20. Okay, and of that 20, how many are white, and uh, how yeah. many are people of color? Yeah, you asked me that last time, Pat, and I apologize for not getting back to you sooner. I, do, I don't have that number yet, but I'll have that for you tomorrow morning. Okay, it's I have kind of for the full count. because I think that I, I remember at the very first meeting when I brought it up, you said, oh, I didn't think of that. Um, and it seems to me that that's something that we need to think about and I need to know the result of, of that. Thank you. Yeah. And I would like to add that in addition to that, Paul, it would be very useful to know other statistics about the ambassadors like where they where they live? Are they students or not? Uh, it just be interesting to know. I met a group of them at one point. I knew at that point, one was from Holyoke, another one was from Springfield. So it just be useful to know. Okay. I'll see what I can get. Are there any other questions of the town manager? All right. Then uh, we're moving on to town council comments. Um, let me just say, I'm, I now have a spreadsheet of all of the topics that people listed the last time. I will be adding the one that came up tonight to that, which is the issue of uh, how we do planning board appointments and zoning board of appeals. Uh, but there's one I want to clarify, and that is one request was to look at the salaries of town councilors. And the real, if you go to the um, actual charter, you will find that it states in section 2.4 of the charter that if you're going to do this, you must do it within the first 18 months of your term. And we have now exceeded the first 18 months of our term. And so we can no longer look at whether or not we would raise the salaries of or the compensation for counselors for the next round of counselors, next terms. So that one is off the chart. That's going to get removed, okay? Here's my chart, see? Another one of my wonderful matrices. Um, <laughs> uh, Dorothy, you have a question. This is a comment, a statement of praise. Uh, thank you to uh, Paul Bachum, the town manager, and to Gilfred Mooring, and to Scott Livingston, and to all the people who made it possible. We have a, I believe, permanent um, speed blinker on Amity Street, which is attractive, and I think it's a little solar-powered top. I'm not sure. Um, affirmative nod from Paul. 
And that I hope will really help in um, stopping some of the speeding on the street because a lot of the speeding is inadvertent. People just don't realize how fast they're going. And most people, when they see that, will slow down. So um, many people have already expressed happiness and joy because this has been a major concern uh, on our street. So I just want to give thanks where thanks are due. So thank you. Okay, and Darcy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I would just like to say two things. One is um, uh, if Mandy Jo or some other person is keeping a running list of potential uh, changes, amendments to the charter, that would be really um, interesting for all of us to take a look at and see if we want to add anything to it. And um, also on the issue of salaries, um, I'm not sure I agree that we should take it off the list of things that we should discuss um, because we might want to put it on that list. And um, it's just unfortunate that the whole Black Lives Matter conversation came up at such a time when it, you know, exceeded that 18 month limit. And, you know, there just were a number of people who said, well, we, we wouldn't be able to run for town council um, if we're not going to be paid a reasonable amount for our work. Um, so it's just a bind that we're in. Um, well, and we're also in that bind because we have a three year and one month term. They're the only right. council that will ever have that. Yeah, so that that is unfortunate. And you know, what do we say to people? Yes, you should you should still run for office. Um, and then once you get elected, you can <laughs> raise your salary. Um, who's going to do that? You you know, that's raise your salary in the term you're in, according to the charter. And in fact, that's also how the state legislature works. You can only raise your salary for the next round of council. Uh, right, right. Um, so, oh, so then they're totally screwed. <laughs> right. Because even if they run thinking that they're going to raise their salaries, it still won't be until the following term. That's correct. So, yeah, yeah, we, we, we missed the boat this time around. Um, and I, I think the charter should allow us to do it. Why wouldn't we not, why would we not be able to do it for the full length of our term? That doesn't make sense. We're not going to have the discussion tonight. I'll add it to the list. No, but I'm just saying. Other issue. Um, yes, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I could get into that as a charter commissioner as to why we didn't allow that, but I'm not going to because we can't, as a council, change the charter. It's that simple. We we can't do it. So um, the charter says what it says. But what I wanted to comment on, I am keeping a list, but I am keeping my own list of what I've seen that I might want the charter to change. I am not keeping a council list or other people's lists. So I encourage other counselors, if they have their own desires of things they don't like in the charter, start your own list because there will be a charter review commission and it will happen in about three years, I believe. And at that time, you as a former or current counselor or whatever it is, whatever you are, whenever that review commission starts, you can send them your list and say, hey, when I was serving or as I'm serving, here's things I found that I didn't like. I'm going to do that with my list, but my list isn't going to agree with your list potentially. Um, and I'm not keeping a council list. The council, when that commission forms, may want to keep their own list or may want to send a list, but that's for another time. So I encourage every counselor, if they find something they don't like about the charter, to write it down for themselves so that when there is a charter review commission, you can forward it to them. Yeah. You have your hand up. 
Uh, yes, just a quickie. I'm really thinking um, a lot about the relationship between council committees and the com community committees. I've, I've been um, encouraged to think about it by a couple of different counselors uh, mm -hmm. and some residents um, and community uh, committee participants. And so I'd like to see that come up uh, on a retreat because I think it's going to be a very intense issue and there may be other issues. I think it's time for us to get together in a different way to look at some of the things that are happening. So one of the options that I have been considering is pulling you for a retreat. Retreats on Zoom are really difficult, uh, but well, my, and the advice I've been given is don't do it for more than about three hours so that beyond that you really becomes kind of useless. So uh, I There's have been our meetings. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but we, work, we're working on it, you know, uh, but I have it on my list of to address and the then let me just get back to the retreats. Are there any other comments at this point? Okay, there are no items under the 48 hour rule. Um, and so we are going to be going into executive session and we will not be reconvening. So we need to take a vote to go into executive session, correct? I move that we move into executive session to consider the purchase exchange, lease or value of real property, um, the chair declares that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the public body. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. You need to read the whole motion, Lynn. Um, the whole motion is, I move. The, you missed the town council will not reconvene an open session following executive session. I, excuse me. And so um, it, then there's a semicolon and says the town council will not reconvene an open session following the following executive session. Now, Pat, is there a second? Second. <laughs> okay. And now we're going to vote. And we start with um, Darcy Dumont. Yes. Grace Mercy, yes. Haneke. Yes. Sam. Yes. Kevin Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Yes. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Emily Paul Milne. Yes. Melissa Brewer. Yes. And Pat Daniel. Yes. Thank you. So the public meeting is now going to end, and there will be a note on Amherst Media for that. You have all received an email, which is includes the new link for the executive session. So you'll go off of this link and go on to a new link. Okay, see you there in about two or three minutes.